so I live in supported housing. This basically means that I have a room inside of a house that I share with others who have learning disabilities. When my best friend moved in, this one particular tenant who we soon started to call Creeper full-on stalked her. He would lurk outside her room late at night, waiting for her to come out. If she didn't come out, he would be outside and knock on her window. He would watch her come out of the shared bathroom from the top of the stairs. He's tried to kiss her and one time he touched her on the shoulder and then said that he was looking after her whenever a support worker asked what he was doing. He's also waited on the stairs when her and I came back from a trip out like half past 11 at night. Needless to say, we waited around the side of the building until he finally went away. He's also watched her through his blinds and he's been warned at least three times by support workers to leave her alone. Now, here's the worst part of it all. He's 45 and she's 22, and he has a girlfriend who he's been with for at least 10 years. But I guess he doesn't really like her very much, judging by the frustrating phone calls that he always has with her on the daily. Now, he's also displayed a milder form of this behavior whenever I moved in. But he started leaving me alone within a few months. But the difference with my friend is that he's totally infatuated with her. So, not only is he emotionally and physically trying to cheat on his girlfriend who he doesn't even seem to like, but he's been doing it ever since my friend moved in, which was pretty much at the beginning of the year. He needs to be charged with harassment and his girlfriend totally needs to dump him. He needs to be thrown out of the house too. If it weren't for whatever he has, he'd probably be in prison. I really wanted to share this because I'm done with him. I wanted him to leave my friend alone. I want him out of the house, but the staff aren't doing anything about it, so I'm going to take matters into my own hands. But at the same time, I just don't really know how to handle it. Hopefully I'll figure something out soon. I noticed a lot of crazy roommate stories, so I thought that I would share my own. This happened during the summer of 2018. I had just finalized a divorce and moved back to my hometown. My parents had let me stay at their place until I was able to find my own. I had just started a really nice high paying job but I was in so much debt from the divorce that I wasn't ready to pay for my place of my own quite yet. I didn't want to mooch off my parents so I decided to find a roommate for the time being. I found a really sweet woman, Raquel, about 15 years older than me, who wanted someone to move in for only about 3 months. This was perfect for me since I was still paying off debt. Everything about Raquel was such a delight. She was sweet, clean, cared about the environment, volunteered, and would always cook food for me just because. I thought that I'd hit the jackpot with her. However, there were a few things about Raquel that were a little off. She wouldn't tell me what she did for a living and she would always tell me that it was just confidential. Whatever her job is, it always caused her to be gone for days, sometimes weeks at a time. I thought that maybe she worked for the government because she had a framed photo of her with Bush Jr. in the Oval Office. Whenever I asked her about it, she just said, That was my last day before leaving the Secret Service. Even though this was odd, I was very impressed. She had this very strict rule in particular. Every single door in the house, including my room, had to be open at all times if it wasn't being occupied. However, this rule didn't apply to her own room. Her door was to be remained closed at all times whether she was there or not. And obviously I was never allowed to go in. Odd but not too concerning. She also claimed to be wicked. I don't know much about the practice but she was really into it. She was constantly going to a nearby wicked store and buying all of the books and garnishes. Besides these few things, she was a very normal person. About a month went by without any kind of concern. I should quickly mention that she had two cats. They would mostly stay in her room but whenever they wanted out they would hit the door with their paws. My room was right next to hers so the sound of it would always drive me nuts. If she wasn't home and I heard the cats trying to get out I would always open her door just enough so they could run out. I know this is breaking the rules but it absolutely drove me nuts. Everything got a little too weird one night when she said that she was out of town for work. It was the first night of her being gone. I was sitting in my room watching TV when I started to hear what sounded like the cats hitting her door and trying to get out. 
I thought, great, she forgot to let the cats out before leaving. I opened my door to let them out of her room when something made me stop dead in my tracks. The cats were just chilling in the hallway. They weren't in the room, but I know that I heard something. Already pretty creeped out about this, I decided to open her door and give a little peek inside. What I then saw were about four people, naked, holding hands in a circle, with all of their heads bowed as if they were praying. I noped the heck out of there so fast and headed straight to my parents. I tried calling Rayquil, but I couldn't get to her. Right when I was about to call the police, she finally called me, and she was livid. She said that I broke her only rule and that she wanted me out of the house immediately. Fine by me. The really eerie part was when I got my bed and dresser back, there was a weird symbol carved into the wood that wasn't there before. The only way that I can really describe it is that it was kind of like a plus sign, but instead of straight lines, they were curved. Like if someone cut an oval in half down the middle, then tried to make a plus. I'm not sure what it's supposed to mean, and I don't think I want to know. This happened in 2009 and landed me in no end of trouble in my anime community. I moved into an apartment with a good friend of mine. Absolutely worst mistake. The guy was popular and pretty much loved, while I just wanted to just run panels at a local convention and just enjoy myself. So far, I was doing pretty fine having a job Monday to Saturday at my college bookstore and also trying to get through senior year of college. I was doing pretty fine until around February. That was when my roommate, that I might as well dub him House Cat, lost his job. I lost mine soon after and I had to drop out to find a new one. Basically for this, I was made to float him. He basically started to become very negative and lashed out at a good friend of mine. It freaked us all out and I went to stay with a friend. I had two interviews, one with a local temp agency and the other was at a library. I took the temp job right away, but it was not fast enough. Housecat made living at the apartment an absolute nightmare. Eventually, I had to get the co-signer, which was my dad, involved in all of this, and he and I evicted Housecat. I was really nervous for months because after this happened, I jumped at shadows because Housecat became really angry at me, and also at my sister and really my family in general. His ex-girlfriend was also no help either, because apparently they blamed me for everything that happened. This had some repercussions to me. I was actually blacklisted from a lot of parties, which was fine. I lost a lot of good friends because of this and still barely have any of them to trust. I also really hate being home by myself. While he was living with me, the friend that he lashed out at, he actually knocked her to the floor and was holding her down. I was in the bathroom trying to cool off and then ran out when I heard a scream. I grabbed my phone and charger when my friend's dad came to come get us. We had just returned from a friend's graduation party. I was really stunned and scared of House Cat. Also, what made my situation really worse was that I have several allergies to certain foods, which also can be found in beer. I absolutely can't have it. I was really terrified because the house cat flaunted this in front of his hands which made me stay in the room most nights. One of his friend's girlfriends decided to sneak some soda into my room, which we downed while playing my PS1 and Nintendo 64. The day that he was evicted I was training at my temp job and I wasn't home at the time. He called via his father's phone to demand that I come back to the apartment. When I got back to the apartment, the bed, his computer, and stereo were all gone. My roommates arrived afterward and I was really relieved. Hopefully I don't run into house cats ever again. And as for the Colorado anime community, thanks for nothing. He really needed help and you clearly value popularity over mental health. I'm really glad that I'll never be part of that again. I do still like anime though. Obligatory happening college to start. During my sophomore year, I lived in the dorms and I was assigned to a random roommate. He seemed a little bit introverted but fairly normal at first, but he really wouldn't talk to me. I would try to start conversations about things that he showed interest in, but he would only give me one word responses that were obviously meant to end the conversation. 
I figured that he probably just didn't like me, so I decided I would give him some space and just leave him alone. After a few days, it started. I would notice that he was always looking in my direction. I chalked it up to coincidence, but it just kept happening. Classes started up and I decided to spend less and less time in the room, but whenever I was there, he would always be constantly looking in my direction. When I would turn to face him, he would turn his head away, but it would always creep me out since it was pretty much constant. I also started to notice that he would lay on his bed to read, but he would hold the book or papers at an angle that always gave him a direct line of sight to me. About a week or so into the semester, my girlfriend at the time and I went on a morning hike and then crashed on my bed at around 2pm. We woke up to him just standing there and staring at us about two hours later. He didn't say anything just turned and then exited out of the room. At that point, I decided I needed to leave before he killed me in my sleep and ate my face, and I was out of there pretty quickly. Fortunately, I didn't see him again for quite a while, but we ended up having a class together senior year. I had been telling my friends the story ever since it happened, and they didn't believe me. One of my friends had really poor vision, so we sat in the front row. Of course, every time I looked behind me, my old roommate was always staring directly at me. Not the teacher, but at me. It didn't matter if we were on the middle or one of the sides. I challenged all of my friends to look back during a single time during the semester and try and catch him not looking at me. Within about five classes, they all gave up and they agreed that he was staring at me nonstop and that it was super creepy. My parents think that he was in love with me, but I still think he just wanted to eat my face. I guess I'll never really know though. Either way, dude was a major creep. So about four months back, I received a message from a guy who was interested in being roommates. He said that his name was M and he seemed super nice. We talked for about an hour and I told him that I would let him know the situation. I did inform him that I was no longer interested and I found another place. He responded that he would still like to be friends, and that's when I had a really strange gut feeling. It was a very bad gut feeling about this guy. I told him that I really apologized if I gave the wrong signal, but I really wasn't interested at all, like period. He texted me about a week later asking how I'm doing. I never responded. I then deleted his number and forgot about the whole thing. That is, until today, months later. I got a text from who I thought was a coworker. This friend had just changed her phone number. The text was asking how I was doing and I said I was doing really good. They then went on to ask if I wanted to hang out and meet and I said sure, but where? I genuinely thought that it was my friend. I kid you not, the phone numbers are off at the end by one digit. Suddenly on my way there, I then realized that I had no idea who this person was. I called them to see and my heart absolutely dropped when I then recognized the dude's voice. I apologized and I told him that I actually thought he was someone else, my coworker. He completely lost his crap and totally freaked out on me, really angry. I apologized and I told him to please never contact me ever again as I was not interested and I would definitely not be meeting him. He was really angry and I wished him a good day then hung up. It was pretty wild. There are three people I'm going to refer to in this story. The roommate in question is Danny, his girlfriend is Veronica. They live with my partner Julia in Colorado in a two-bedroom apartment. I also just want to add that my partner and I both are non-binary. We have a long-distance relationship and I try and fly out there as often as I can afford. Julia will be moving out of this apartment in January and has already found a new roommate. I found out this information late September during my last visit to Colorado. It makes me very uncomfortable to talk about, but I would like to write it down as a way to process it and try and get some input. Veronica is young, 19, and I believe Danny is also 19. Veronica approached me for advice for her relationship with Danny because she learned that I was 27. We sit outside on the patio of earshot of Danny and she tells me about her insecurities in her relationship. Normal things. Am I attracted enough to him? Is he cheating on me? And so on. The whole time I'm just like, 
You're beautiful. Don't compare yourself to others. If he's cheating on you, you need to dump him. Veronica, Veronica then tells me she goes through Danny's phone all the time. She's very paranoid and she believes that he's cheating. This girl goes on to tell me some really messed up crap and that she's unearthed things on Danny's phone that make my skin crawl. Apparently Danny takes videos and pictures of random women in public. There's a video that Veronica found and actually confronted him with it. In the video, he zooms in on women's chests who's standing out at a train station. Danny, trying to defend himself, says, Oh no, that's just Julia. They asked me to take a picture of them. Pretty weird, right? This was before Veronica had met my partner, and that's how she caught Danny in his lie. The person in the recording was definitely not Julia. Even more paranoid, she decided to dig a little bit deeper. She found some more inappropriate photos and videos on his phone. I don't really feel comfortable describing the details. He likes to photograph a certain type of women. They're all different but have specific features in common. She's actually walked in on him masturbating to these images. Veronica says that she's really embarrassed by his hobby but shows no sign of stopping. I'm absolutely floored by all of this. My mind couldn't process what she had told me. And honestly, I'm about to puke writing and thinking about this. I had no qualms with Danny before this. He's a big boisterous guy, young, so he's sort of annoying, but it's not like we're really friends. This moment changed that immediately, and I then thought back on all of the red flags that I could have missed. Veronica is visibly on the brink of crying now. I'm condensing my response here. Danny is a creep and this is not normal behavior. I feel tremendously guilty. Can Veronica even report him for this? Can I report him even if I haven't seen the photos? Veronica is still dating Danny, so I really doubt she would want to. I don't believe that she made this up, though, because of how upset this made her. She even told her dad about it, who also said that it was messed up. I mean, it bothered her enough to tell me, who's no more than an acquaintance to her. I decided to tell Julia all about this after a really long day of waiting for them to get home from work, and Julia got physically ill when I told them about Danny. I'm fairly certain that learning this information has really impacted Julia's decision of not renewing a lease with Danny. I really do want to visit Julia in December, but I don't want to see Danny ever again. I feel absolutely disgusted and so uncomfortable. I feel so terrible for all of those people in the photos and videos. Danny is a seriously disgusting person. I just started my freshman year of college. I'm going to a college out of my home state and no one I know is going to the same university as me, which means that I'm going to be rooming with a total stranger. Pretty normal, right? Well, that's what I thought. When I met my roommate, who I'm going to be referring to as DJ, she seemed nice enough. Her parents seemed nice enough too. Everything was going fine for the first couple of weeks but then DJ's odd habits began emerging. I noticed that every time I would sit at my desk, she would always move from wherever she was to sit on the floor right behind me. And I mean every time. The first few times, I thought it was just coincidental because it happened when she would be entering the room from her last classes. I thought that maybe she just wanted to relax by sitting on the floor. Weird, yes, but plausible. But no. Then the other scenarios began happening. She has a beanbag set right by next to me, so close that it's touching me, and this is her favorite spot that she always sits there to do her homework and whatnot. If I decide I want to sit at my desk, she'll actually move from the beanbag and then the floor behind me. Sometimes she doesn't even do anything. She'll just sit there. She abandons her homework to sit behind me. I don't really sit at my desk too often anymore because of this very reason. DJ also has a job that she has to get to by 8am every week, which means that I typically get woken up very early. I usually just roll over and try to get some extra sleep. A couple of times now though, I've actually woken up to DJ staring at me. One time she was about a foot away from the bed and just staring. She also makes a point to look at me whenever she leaves, but it doesn't end there. I'm utterly disgusted by hair, right? Like it actually makes me sick to my stomach whenever I see hair all over the floor. 
Well, DJ has this really long curly red hair, which is fine, only she sheds so much hair that I've seen her actually sit there and pull her hair out. Okay, whatever. But one day I decided that I wanted to wash my sheets. I don't even sleep with my sheets. I'll typically only sleep with a throw blanket to her, only my comforter. I really never go under my sheets, but I do lay on top of them, so they still deserve to be washed. When I pulled back the sheet, I was then met with strings of DJ's long curly hair. I nearly threw up over it. I have no idea how it got there and I'm not really sure I want to know. But hold on, it gets better. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, DJ and I share the same class together. Whenever class ends, she sits there and waits for me to pack up my notebooks and things and then we walk back to our room together. Only, here's what's strange. She never tries to talk to me. She usually just walks like about two feet right behind me. By itself, that probably seems kind of normal, but with everything else, it just sort of feels like she's watching me. Perhaps not the creepiest story out there, but still very unnerving for me personally. This occurred over the last couple of days, as I moved in with a friend on Christmas Eve, and the other temporary housemate went from pleasant old man stoner to actually drugging my friend and attempting to drug me. I'm a female. The friend and I both are in our mid-twenties, and the temporary housemate is in his sixties. So due to my own circumstances, I needed a new place to stay, and a friend Jimmy needed a reliable housemate to replace the old one who had left a few weeks before. I got approval from the real estate agent and shortly moved in with all of my belongings. The old housemate had invited a couple of his own friends who were right out of prison, one of which who had been turned out two days before Christmas for painting the bathroom wall with feces while drunk and high, and the other who seemed like a perfectly normal old man who just enjoyed the odd drink and a little bit of weed. The housemate is known as Bible Man, as he was also a recent convert to Christianity and apparently he believes the rapture is going to happen sometime in 2020. So after a really fun Christmas and Boxing Day with the family, I returned home to hang out with Jimmy. We were looking at memes when Bible Man then barges into the room. He has no concept of boundaries and he's been doing this for the two nights that I'd already spent there. Bible Man both looked and acted pretty wasted. He also seemed high, but claimed that he had only had two beers. He also didn't have any money to even buy those beers. He called out to Jimmy and he told him to come with him to the kitchen. Jimmy complied and Bibleman insisted that he drink some whiskey from a glass. Jimmy tried to refuse but just gave in and gave it a drink. Bibleman then came and tried to offer me a joint which I absolutely refused but he rolled anyway. Jimmy came back into the room and we looked at more of the memes for a while. Then Bibleman came back and tried to call Jimmy out to fix something. We tried to ask what it was that was broken, but he refused to say what it was. Jimmy left to go check it out and Bibleman came back into the room and then tried to push the joint right into my hand. He forced himself into my personal space and whispered into my ear to hide it from Jimmy, then left. There was nothing to fix. After a couple of hours, Jimmy started to feel really tingly and sleepy. He went to go lay down and Bibleman jumped at the chance to be alone in the room with me. He starts going on about how he knows Jimmy has hepatitis and that I shouldn't sleep with him, and also how he was sinning and bumming with the other temporary housemaid who painted the walls and a lot of other nonsense that was really hardly understandable. Over the next couple of hours, Bibleman would check on Jimmy, which was not normal behavior, while also turning the stereo up as high as it went telling me how I forget how beautiful I am and trying to convince me to smoke the joint that he had made. I eventually went to Jimmy's room to ask him for some help to try and get Bible Man to leave me alone. Jimmy had to ask me to turn out his lights as he couldn't get up and he looked very tired and confused. At one point, Bible Man began to rant about Christmas Eve, saying that Jimmy had shut all of the doors and declaring that he was going to screw me. Also, how I shouldn't be friends with Jimmy and I should be afraid to sleep at night. The look on his face when he said it actually made me afraid to sleep that night. But not afraid of Jimmy, afraid of Bible Man. He also got into my personal bubble multiple times and accidentally touches my breasts. Keyword, accidentally. I eventually convinced him to leave me alone and then push the boxes in front of my door. 
I still wasn't able to sleep for hours that night. As he never went out to smoke, I'm absolutely convinced that he had spiked a joint or had some other kind of ill intent. The way that he pushed and begged me to smoke, it was just way too creepy, and I don't do any kind of drugs, so it's not like it was a normal thing that he knew I did or something. The next morning, Jimmy had told me that he had a really patchy memory of the whole afternoon and evening, even though what Bible Man had given him was the only thing he had drunk all day. We were both really uncomfortable and really upset at his behavior. After talking about it, we realized that he was far too drunk to only have had two beers, and we were thinking that he had shoplifted from the bottle shop. But then the dread hit me. I looked into the container where we put our rent money. There was $50 from the rent that was missing, and only I and Jimmy had put our rent in. So angry and really upset, we decided to get Jimmy's scary looking dad to come on over and convince Bible Man that it was time for him to leave. He came back later in the evening and we still had to use the threat of calling Jimmy's dad to convince him to take his stuff and get out of there. I feel really bad about turfing him out at night, but it's summer in Australia, so he'll be fine. After talking with some people in the bottle shop and a taxi driver and security guard who all knew him, apparently he had been caught stealing the last few days and he was actually in prison for a pretty good reason. So to Bible Man the really sketchy housemate that drugged my friend and tried to drug me. Hopefully we don't have to see you ever again. To give the context of where this story is based, I live in a smallish college town near a small to medium sized city. The town itself doesn't have a lot of people and is mostly here to cater to the demand that comes from the college. Because of this, the stores around the college are mostly open 24-7 so that the college kids will be able to impulse buy whatever they like. The other big seller around here is gas. Of course, gas can be bought in the city, but being a town that has often gone through in order to get to the city, a lot of places will try to keep the price of gas slightly lower than any of the stations in the city. My story begins when I was working overnights at a gas station slash liquor store when I was doing part-time classes in college, but mostly doing classes online so that they wouldn't run my availability for a full-time job. The store that I worked at had only one person working on overnights for a long time. Even though a lot of people, especially girls, would complain of the lack of cameras and the fact that you don't always get the best people going into the liquor store and gas station in the middle of the night. The owner's hand was forced on one night, before I started working there, that a woman who came in to buy milk went outside to her car, only for a man to come up behind her and then shove a gun up to her back, then demanding her for money. She complied with him, and luckily, he let her go. She ran into the store, sobbing hysterically, and though the police arrived shortly after, he was never found. I personally preferred to having two people on with me, even if there wasn't a safety issue. The night seemed to go by so much quicker when someone else was there, and it was really nice that the person I normally close with got along with me so well. Overall, there were four overnight shift workers, Josh, Nick, Dixie, and myself. Dixie had another job and was really only working there as a favor to one of the managers, so she would really only work about two nights a week with either Josh or I. Josh and I worked together about three nights a week, and Nick worked with Josh or I about two nights a week. Dixie was really nice and fun to be around, but she didn't really particularly like the job or really want to be there. Josh would get annoyed with her a lot for just standing behind the register while he did all the work, but it was only one night a week, so he didn't really complain too much. Nick, on the other hand, was a little bit different. He worked there five days a week, just like Josh and I, but they never seemed to put him with more than one person one day a week. Nobody seemed to really like him or like working with him. Nick was also a little off from the start. He was one of those people who basically told you his entire life story as soon as he met you, giving a bunch of really personal details that no one was really comfortable with hearing. One thing that he always seemed to talk about was the strain that was on his marriage. Apparently, he had a really bad drinking and drug problem for a very long time, and the drug part got better when he could switch over to weed, but he couldn't seem to get his drinking under control. 
He was hard to be around, but you kind of get used to the people in that kind of job being sketchy. I was there for almost three months when Nick's story seemed to escalate out of nowhere. He began telling people that when he was younger, he was diagnosed as a psychopath, and he had to take a bunch of pills for it every day so he wouldn't be violent. Not exactly what you want to hear from someone you're alone with in the middle of the night, but okay. We all have our problems, and some people get dealt a really bad hand when it comes to mental illness. I myself have always really struggled to get my anxiety and depression under control, and without medicine, I mean, I wouldn't be killing people by any means but I'd probably be hospitalized in danger to self categories, so as creepy as that was, I just assured them that a lot of people need to take medicine for some kind of illness, and as long as you stick with it and you're honest with medical professionals, there's no reason you can't still do anything anyone else can do. He seemed really pleased with this answer, and soon after, the subject was then turned to other things. He was especially cheery and nice to me after that for about the next week or so, letting me know daily that he was taking his medicine and he felt like things were really going well with them. I always answered enthusiastically, but I'm pretty sure everyone, especially Josh, was aware of how much I wished that he would just stop talking to me about it and would really just leave me alone. Josh had a wife and daughter who was about two at the time, so he couldn't help but to see us younger girls as kind of like his daughter and what she might have to deal with one day. He also seemed to go out of his way to end my conversations with Nick rather quickly, which I was really grateful for, and he didn't really try to pretend that he liked Nick. It wasn't too long before Nick had started conversations with me going into details about why I was diagnosed instead of how his medicine was working, which I won't get into because a lot of it was very violent and sexual. I told him repeatedly that I really didn't want to know about that, to which he would act like he understood and then change the subject only for him to circle back to it about an hour later. When I confided in Dixie about it, she told me that she would take care of it. She later told her friend about it, which was the same manager who asked her to come work there. The manager said she couldn't really do much, since I seemed to be the only one that he would talk to about these things. It was starting to get increasingly tense for everyone working with him after he was talked to by the manager, and soon enough, about two other women who had worked with him on the night shift reported comments that he made to them to the manager. I was questioned in which I agreed that all of the statements made by the women were pretty similar to the things that had been said to me. Nick was then given a final warning and a write-up. The next couple of times I saw him, he would go on these rants about how the people that were reporting him only did it because they didn't like him. I assumed that he didn't know that I had been questioned too, and neither I or Josh had any intention to tell him. He got so angry at one point that he was practically in tears, saying how those lucky whores were really lucky that he was on his meds and what he would do to them if he wasn't. Luckily, it was about that point that his shift had ended, and pretty much as soon as he clocked out, Josh then told him that we had a lot of work to get done that night, so we really didn't have time to chat with him. He nodded and walked out the door without another word. Josh wasn't lying either. The truck had arrived extremely late that day, so there was still quite a bit of things that still needed to be put on the shelf. One thing that the earlier shifts never seemed to do unless they absolutely had to was stocking the drink coolers. It was true that it was easier to do at night when there was a lot less customers, so it was pretty annoying since we couldn't chat, but we just went with it. I can't really remember the time that Josh had went into the drink cooler, but it must have been pretty late since we had been there for a while at that point. I was still pretty focused on stocking all of the shelves and making sure everything looked full if we didn't have it, when the bell had chimed, signaling that someone had come into the store. I threw out a good evening and said that I'd be right there, since anyone that usually came in that late usually just wanted a pack of cigarettes or to pay for gas. I put down my box and went to the registers slowing dramatically once I could see them. You guessed it. There was Nick, not looking at me, but leaning over to my register. I'd be lying if I said I had a reason to be afraid. It did turn out he was drunk, but I wasn't able to detect it right away, as the smell of booze always seemed to linger in the air around there anyways. And Josh was right on the other side of the wall. Even so, 
I actually considered for about 30 seconds if I should actually go or if I should run into the cooler and go get Josh. Nick wasn't a young fit guy or anything, but years of drugs and drinking had really aged him prematurely and totally ruined his body. But I mean, he was still pretty intimidating to a 20-year-old girl. Unfortunately, Nick made the decision for me when probably tired of waiting, turned right toward me, and that's when I noticed something immediately was off about him. My voice was nothing more than a pathetic whisper when I asked him what he wanted. He just stared at me. There was nothing on his face to tell me what he was thinking. I was about to speak again when he then spoke, barely intelligible because of his slurring. Did he leave you alone? It took me a second to shake my head and tell him in a hopefully steady voice that Josh was in the cooler, and then I asked if he wanted me to go get him. And once again, he was just staring at me in silence. At this point, I didn't even care what he said. I just wanted him to say something. The silent staring was really creeping me out. I then decided to ask with more force in my voice. What do you want, Nick? As soon as I stopped speaking, he then grinned at me in a really disgusting, almost singing voice. Then he said, You're lying. I know you're alone. He laughed and then he took a step toward me but stumbled, allowing me to take several steps backwards. At this point, I should have just run to Josh. I should have called for him, really anything, but I really couldn't believe that I was reading the situation right. I mean, Nick was really weird, but I had never felt like I was in actual danger around him. He had never come off as more than a little unstable. He continued to come forward in slow stumbling steps, then saying, Come here. I just want to talk. I kept out of his reach, telling him to back off and that I would hurt him if I had to. He thought that that was specifically amusing, and he laughed loudly enough that Josh had told me later was what caused him to look through the spaces of the racks to see what was going on. Josh was out the door in a second, and he seemed to come out of nowhere, then shoving himself in between Nick and I. They didn't even say anything. They just stared each other down before Josh then said in a really stern tone, I think you should leave now. Nick just blankly stared for a moment, then scoffed, then telling us that we couldn't take a joke. I was trying not to cry at this point. The only thing more terrifying about the situation was knowing that if Josh hadn't been there and had somehow caught me, I would have stood no chance against Nick. Josh left me standing with my back against the wall, quarreling Nick to the door. Completely unexpected on both of our parts, Nick then turned and then took a swing at Josh. Luckily, either because he was drunk or really just really uncoordinated, he missed Josh's face and Josh then grabbed the back of his coat and then brought him down as he then smashed his knee into Nick's stomach or chest area. I'm not really sure which, but he used the opportunity of his sputtering to drag him to the door and then throw him out, now locking it. Josh had just turned and he told me to call the cops as we then heard the sickening crack from behind him. We both jumped and looked at the door to then find this really big circle of glass. It's hard to explain, but if you've ever seen a movie or one of an actual car wreck when something hits a windshield, but not hard enough to break through and it turns white all around the point of impact, that's what the door looked like. Josh didn't have to tell me what to do. This time I ran to the register, grabbed my phone, going to the corner farthest away from the front door, and then huddled on the floor. I didn't even notice at the time, but Josh had told me later that when he turned to see the glass, that was the first time that he noticed that Nick had a knife in his other hand. The fact that he tried to punch Josh instead of stab him is a mystery and a miracle. I was absolutely sobbing when the operator picked up the phone. I don't even know how she understood me. I was crying so loud. But between my distress and the sounds of Josh and Nick yelling at each other in the background with loud smashes of Nick hitting the floor, she got the urgency of the situation. She asked me where I was and luckily she knew the address because just as I got up to look at a receipt to what the address was, the glass smashed. I dropped back to the floor and she told me that the officers were already on the way and to do whatever I could to get away or even hide, even if that meant that I had to leave Josh. The hole wasn't big enough for him to get through, but he made it by grabbing the ashtray from outside and then throwing it at the part of the window that he had been repeatedly punching, causing it to break through. 
He didn't make it to break through though. From that hole, he could reach the lock on the door, then get back inside. According to Josh, he had walked up to the door and then he put his mouth against the hole that he had just formed and then said something that even right now I still sob over in that horrible sing-song voice that he used the first time I talked to him that night. He then said in such a happy tone, They're never going to find you two. Needless to say, as tough as he was acting, Josh was shitting bricks just as much as I was. He was older than Nick, in his mid-thirties, but he was a beanpole, and he wasn't exactly known for his fighting skills. Even so, as soon as Nick unlocked and started to open the door, Josh then slammed his entire body into it, knocking Nick backwards from the impact. Josh then yelled for me to run and even though my legs felt like they would give out at any moment, I ran right behind him to the receiving doors that were in the back of the store. Nick was cursing and yelling for us as the door jingle went off. Josh slammed into the back door cursing in pain as he then realized that it wouldn't open. We found out later that Nick had pushed the dumpster in front of the door, locking the wheels of it again before he came in. We seemed to both realize at once that he had actually planned this all out to kill us. Nick rounded the corner, still doing that awkward stumbling walk, though faster now. It at least gave me some time to slam the back room door shut and then lock it. I was sitting in front of it, Josh bringing over anything he could find to barricade the door shut, when Nick then finally reached it. He must have heard me crying because he kept calling my name, telling me that I wasn't who he wanted. He would make sure that I died before I felt any kind of pain if I opened the door for him. He then started stabbing the door, then screaming at me to open it. I screamed and then I moved when he stabbed it the first time, but Josh and I both then moved immediately to hold it shut again. I remember Josh and I making eye contact. We were both crying by now and I wanted so badly to say something to comfort him but I just couldn't think of anything to say. I was just as terrified myself. I had dropped my phone when I ran to hold the door shut and neither of us could move to go get it. So we really had no idea how long it would be until the police got there and the door was made of wood so it wouldn't really last long against his body slams. And there was absolutely no protection if his knife went into one of our hands. All I could think about was that I was going to die here tonight. That my dog would never know why I didn't come home that I would never get my degree and have enough money to actually start enjoying life, that all of the plans for the future that my girlfriend and I had made would never happen. In the most anticlimactic and wonderful finish ever, it suddenly went silent. There was no police car alarms, no yelling, nothing. It was as if Nick had just vanished. Josh and I looked at each other, not even daring to breathe, then listening for any sign of life on the other side of the door. We both slammed to the ground when we heard a gunshot then go off once, then twice, then a third time. There was more silence, then at last a voice rang out, then asking if anyone was here. We weren't really sure if we should say anything, then the voice continued with his name and that he was an off-duty EMT who had been listening to the scanner. Josh got up and pushed all of the things aside in front of the door, opening it enough just to put his head out of it and then it seemed like all of the breath just totally left him. He opened the door and went out into the store. I ran and grabbed my phone, seeing that the call had disconnected or the dispatcher had hung up. When I went out into the store where Josh and our rescuer was, he was in the middle of explaining how the police over the scanner were sending a bunch of cars, but that they were all pretty far away and he had a really horrible feeling that they wouldn't get there in time when the dispatcher was telling them what they'd find when they got there. He didn't want either of us to go outside until the police got there because though Nick had been shot in the shoulder, he still had the knife when he took off. The EMT said that he would have run after him, but with the state that the store was in, he was really scared that someone in the store could be dying or hurt. The next 20 minutes were a total blur. Josh and I were just sitting on the floor hugging each other when the police finally arrived. The EMT had called dispatch and he told them of the new situation and most of the cars that were coming to our location were then diverted to looking for Nick. It was soon after that that Josh got to use his phone to call his wife and she came right over, only bringing their daughter because he begged her to. He seemed to completely break down when he held his daughter and hugged his wife. 
I had an extremely similar reaction when I finally got to go home and came in to see my dog's wiggling body as he was so excited to see me. Nick was found about two weeks later in an old RV that he had in the woods. The reason that he had come after us was because he thought that the reason Josh wanted him to leave so quickly was so that he could call the owner again, and this time the complaint would get him fired. Unknown to us, his wife had actually kicked him out about four days before this all happened, and she was actually in the process of getting a restraining order against him, due to a bunch of threatening texts and phone calls that she had been getting. Nick stated to the police that his job was all that he had left, and Josh needed to be punished for trying to take that away from him. He said that I wasn't the target and he really didn't want to have to kill me, but he knew that he had a much better chance of killing Josh with me there than Dixie, since Josh would be more likely to face him to protect me. Neither Josh or I called an owner or even a manager over his comments that night, though maybe we should have. It was really disturbing what he was saying in hindsight, but we were so used to him being a creep and saying really horrible things that it didn't even register to us that he could be serious about trying to hurt someone. I had known him for three months and Josh had known him for six, and he had never done anything violent toward anyone. Everyone just thought he was all talk. We also put faith in the fact that every employee had a background check on them before they were hired. So I mean, it's not like Nick had ever been violent before. Nick took a plea deal. He did this so that the two counts of attempted murder would be dropped, and instead would go to a mental hospital for offenders. The reason that I'm writing this story now is that I got a phone call about two weeks ago. It was basically notifying me that as long as there's no setbacks to his health, Nick is actually set to be released on June 8th of this year. When I called Josh, he said that he had received the same news the day before. Neither Josh or I work there anymore, and Josh has since moved away to another town on the other side of the city. I've switched to going to college completely online, and I'm in a new place that I'm renting with a roommate. I really don't think that he'll ever come after either of us. I don't see how he could blame us for what happened. I read so many of these stories, and after the fact, everyone always seems so prepared for what to do if they ever see the person they're writing about again. I really don't think that I'd be any more prepared to face him this time than I was back then. I've had some pretty intense nightmares ever since that day, but ever since I got that call, every time I close my eyes, all I can hear is that one sentence louder and clearer than I've ever heard it since it was actually said. They're never going to find you two. Nick, if it's really true that you were diagnosed as a psychopath, I hope you're getting the help you need. You already destroyed my peace of mind, and even now, years later, I never feel safe, especially at night. I'm honestly going to do my best to move on from this, but I just don't know how. Wish me luck. I've never really told this story, at least not completely but it's something that I still think about from time to time. It kind of haunts me. I used to work as a manager of a fast food place in a rather seedy part of a medium-sized city. I'd worked at the nicer location until they decided to transfer me, and there were actually rumors that the location I ended up being sent to was going to be shut down, which did end up happening a few years after I left. Anyway, the point is that the place wasn't being well taken care of, the dining room was really dated and old, and the owners were certainly not updating or maintaining the place well. They were just barely maintaining the very basic safety requirements, and sometimes they weren't even doing that. For example, I often worked the closing shift, which for this location at the time was 4 p.m. to midnight. Between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m., it was running the drive through and the front counter all by myself, and then one employee running the kitchen. At 11 p.m., that other employee would go home, and I was left by myself to tidy up and then do the deposit around 11 p.m. to 12 p.m. This isn't really safe, and I'm really not even sure if it was entirely legal at the time. This was over a decade ago, though, so who really knows? Just to provide a little context and background here, I'm a girl, but I'm not what you would consider small. I'm about six foot, 
And during this time, I think people would probably say that I came across as a little more than stern. I was younger, but I'd already spent years working in fast food, constantly getting treated like crap by customers, as well as having drinks and food thrown at me. The location that I worked at was absolutely riddled with junkies and drug dealers, and just general, really scary behavior. All this to say, I didn't really get ruffled that easily, and I took a lot of things in stride. However, on this night, I was working the night shift with a new guy. The new guy had probably been working there for no more than a few weeks. I'd worked with him a few times before, but never the closing shift. And from the first time I'd met him, I'd always got this really strange vibe from him. And again, I'm not someone who got ruffled up easily. Prior to this, I'd actually worked with a night janitor at the other location, who'd had an Adderall addiction and a rather unpredictable and scary rage problem and some creepy incel kid who barely spoke more than two words at a time. And when he did, it was always something about how much he disliked women, and me in particular. And I'm not exaggerating. But this guy, this new dude, he was a whole different level of weird. He had a kid and he professed to be a single father. He would bring the kid around work during the day and the kid and his clothing were always really dirty. Like really dirty. And not only that, but the kid also occasionally had bruises on his head and arms. The kid was a toddler, and I know that toddlers can get into things, but one look at that kid, and I just knew that those bruises were not something from a little kid just messing around. Now, I never saw the new guy behave aggressively toward his kid like at all, but I don't know. It was just a feeling, and that feeling translated into other things. I don't know. He was just really creepy. It wasn't one thing in particular, it was just a feeling I got whenever I was around him. He was a medium height, stocky young guy. He was totally average in every way, but he just had this really weird vibe about him. He was always really friendly, never rude or aggressive, but his eyes were just lifeless, for a lack of a better description. Anyway, on this night in particular, I think that he might have been called in to cover a shift for someone else. Most of the time, I was in charge of making the schedules, so I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't have scheduled him to work with me since I found him so off-putting. The first part of the night was fairly normal. I ran the drive through in the front counter and he ran the kitchen between 8 to 11 p.m. He was talking to me on and off between orders, telling me about his ex and how he'd become a single father. Apparently, the mother of his child had a drug problem. In hindsight, I think a lot of what he said was meant to inspire sympathy. He really laid the troubled tale of him and his son on thick, but at the time, I just felt a little bad for both of them, especially his kid, who I suspected was being abused. But despite being seen as stern, I was definitely still young and naive whenever it came to manipulative people. He told me that he moved to the city and pretty much immediately had trouble finding work prior to getting the job at the place we worked at. He said that he'd been running out of money and was really behind on rent, bills, and didn't have any formula for a son. At the time, I think I just empathized with him and I told him that it sucked. I mean, we were both working in fast food, so I thought it was pretty obvious that neither of us had any money. The place was bare bones minimum wage and I was barely getting by with three roommates and I was pretty much only eating the free meal that I was given a day from the restaurant. Anyway. He laid it on thick pretty much all night long, but I really don't know that I was really paying all that much attention to it. People tended to ramble whenever working the late shift, and I'd gotten pretty used to listening to people spontaneously talk about their personal problems. I kind of had a habit of just listening and not really reciprocating the sharing, and I guess this didn't really go over very well with the new guy. At some point, the new guy then said something to the effect of, you don't talk much, do you? I'm telling you my whole life story here and you've got nothing to say? Now, I don't know if it was just that I was coming across as unsympathetic, or more likely that he was really just frustrated that he wasn't manipulating me into giving up personal details about my life. As far as I was concerned, he was just someone I worked with, and I didn't know him. I didn't really want him to know me, and I certainly wasn't about to tell him anything that wasn't surface level chit chat. But the guy was really intimidating. Something about his tone was just really off. 
It definitely wasn't a jokey accusation or off-the-cuff comment. I can't really remember exactly what I said, but I remember that I just tried to play it off somehow. He didn't really say anything else about it, but after that happened, the silence between us seemed a little tense. At 11pm, it was time for him to go home. The normal procedure was the person closing the kitchen would tidy up their area, and then an actual kitchen cleaner would come back in a couple hours later to deep clean things. In our case, it was a husband and wife team who did several locations, but they didn't usually come in until a few hours after I left. So this guy was only tasked with basic tidy, and then I would let him out, after which I would stay behind to prepare the deposit. But instead of this happening smoothly, this guy then goes into the staff bathroom and stays there. And I mean for a really long time, like almost 20 minutes or something. I didn't know what was going on, nor did I know exactly how to handle it. It had honestly never happened before. People could usually not get out of there fast enough at the end of the night. Was he sick? Did he fall asleep? I didn't know, but I really just wanted to get my work done and go home. He finally emerged and then quickly walked to the door and left. I was relieved. It was weird, but I just shrugged it off and hurried back to the office to get done what I needed to get done. Not ten minutes later, I start to hear a really loud banging at the back door of the restaurant. Repeatedly. Now, normally, I would just ignore this. The back door faced an alley and it was right next to a street full of bars and pubs. People leaving bars and pubs often got the idea that banging on the door would get them after hours fast food service because, well, they were drunk. So this wasn't necessarily uncommon. So I decided to just ignore it and keep hurrying to get things done. But I kid you not, the banging didn't stop. It somehow just seemed to get louder and louder and more urgent. So I finally got up and went to look out the peephole to see who was there. At this point, I was definitely on edge and this edginess swelled into a full-out anxiety attack when I see that it's the new guy standing at the back door. My first thought was not to open the door. I really didn't want to open the door, but I knew that he knew that I was in there. What if he forgot something inside? What if it was his house keys, car keys, or something important? I was going to have to leave the building by that same door at some point, so there really seemed to be no escaping him. So reluctantly, I opened the door. What I opened the door to was, quite frankly, absolutely terrifying to me. He said that he left his jacket inside the store, and I told him to tell me where and I'd go get it. I just really didn't want him to come inside. Now, if this had been any other person that I worked with normally, this wouldn't be a big deal. I'd let them back in, let them get whatever they left behind, and they'd take off. But I instinctively knew that I didn't want this dude back inside, in the dark empty restaurant, all alone with me. But the new dude was totally not having it. He pushed past me and said he'd get it himself. Then he proceeded to shut himself in the bathroom again. And at this point, I just panicked. Instead of just staying there by the door, which in hindsight I probably should have done, I rushed back to the office. I know, I'm stupid. Stupid girl, which is me, had left some of the cash that I was counting for the deposit out. What dummy would answer the back door at night at all? And especially with a till out. Well, I guess my dumbass. I managed to stuff the cash in the safe and then lock it before he came to find me. The office was dark. It was summer and the air conditioning was on full blast, but this dude was sweating a crap ton. I was taller than him and I'm not a small girl, but somehow I just knew that this guy was about to hurt me. He was keyed up. As I watched his eyes dart around the office, I then grabbed my jacket, which was hanging on the hook next to me. I hadn't finished my deposit, but I didn't care. I was gonna get out of there. I didn't care how much crap I got into in the morning for my work not being done. I smiled and told him that I was just leaving and that he could walk me out. I was really just trying my best not to show my panic. Whatever he had planned, I wanted to give him an out for him to rethink. So I smiled, grabbed my purse, and started to move towards the door. New guy who was standing in the doorway did not budge though. He started talking though about his son, about the money trouble he'd been having, and then capped the whole story off with a request for a loan. Now, from the tone of his voice, it was clear this was not a loan. He was demanding money from me. 
He said that he would pay me back as soon as he got paid and that I'd really be helping him out. I really didn't know what to do. He had me trapped. I wasn't leaving the office or the building unless he allowed it. Or at this point at least, I wasn't leaving without a fight. Something told me that despite my height difference, I wasn't going to win. So I decided to give him some money from my wallet. It was around $50, I think. When I gave it to him, he then said, Thanks. You're really helping me and my son. I won't forget it. But when he said it, he had no expression, no smile, and no speech effect at all. He didn't seem grateful or even relieved, just dead eyes and limp arms at his sides. It was terrifying. To this day, I don't really remember how I got him to the door. All I remember was shutting the door behind him, making sure the door was securely locked, and then rushing into the office to burst into tears. I didn't finish my work, but I stayed there until I could force myself to leave out of that same door. I was pretty sure he was going to jump me when I left. The thought never occurred to me to call the cops. I don't know why. I guess I just felt like nothing serious had happened yet. He'd asked me for money and I'd willingly given it to him, despite the fact that I felt I had no choice and had been scared shitless the entire night. I only saw him one more time after that, but neither of us ever mentioned that night or the money. I really don't know why I didn't ask for it back. I think I was embarrassed or scared, or both. I don't know. I don't think I've ever told anyone in my life this story. Or at least if I have, I definitely left out the part where I gave him the money and never got it back. Not too long after that, he stopped showing up to his shifts and I never saw him again. I don't believe in throwing words like psychopath around. I really feel like people overuse psychological terms like that, making them just synonymous with anyone who's horribly behaved. And unfortunately, there's a lot of varying degrees of terribly behaved people in this world. But after taking a lot of abnormal psych classes, I can say that there was definitely something about this guy's effect that was just wrong. I'd smile, he'd smile. I'd frown, he'd frown. It was almost like talking to someone pantomiming emotions. Maybe I'm just remembering it that way because it was such a terrifying experience for me. But the truth is that I've never been comfortable talking about this event. And to this day, whenever I think about it, I feel just as uncomfortable as the day it all happened. I never want to experience anything like that again. So it was around June 2019. I was doing a closing shift at the McDonald's I work at in town. We close up at 2 a.m. on the weekdays and 3 a.m. on the weekend. It had been a Saturday night shift, so I was finished and out of the building by about 3.15 a.m. roughly. When this happened, I was living about a 10 to 15 minute walk from my work in a flat that was mostly taken up by students. I didn't really have any money to spare to constantly get taxis, and I'd been walking home at night for the past year with really no incidents, so of course, I didn't really think anything would happen. The majority of the walk was fine, and I was about four minutes away from the flat when I noticed a guy just standing around near the corner that I'd turned to get home. I'm really weary when I see other people, but usually they're just drunk and they mind their own business and just ask for directions, or it's a homeless person, as there's quite a lot in the city I live in. But at that time of night, like I said before, they usually just keep to themselves. This guy was dressed pretty nice, but casual. Looked around mid-twenties, well-groomed, tan skin, and this really strong-smelling aftershave. He obviously was a regular at the gym, too, because he had a really muscular figure, and he didn't seem to be too drunk by the looks of things. But I mean, who knows? I really tried to keep my distance, but he then approached me and started making really casual conversation. Asking me what my name was, complimenting my accent, and asking me where I'm from. I stupidly engaged with him but gave him a fake name and then made it clear that I wasn't up for a chat. I should have been firm with my words but I'm way too introverted and shy to speak up. Even my own boyfriend complains that I talk too quietly sometimes and I really struggle to be direct with people. Throughout the whole conversation he was always giving me this really unsettling smile and he would try and touch my arm or play with my hair which I made as clear as I possibly could that I didn't approve of it. Not that he was even listening. 
He would just say something along the lines of, But you're just so pretty. Not flattering at all when it's a man who won't take no for an answer. Anyways, this guy asked me for a hug and even though I refused him as politely as possible, he did it anyways. I froze up for a couple of seconds before I moved away, which thankfully he let me do. He was being extremely creepy at this point and tried feeling over at my sides as he hugged me, which gave me even more red flags. I told him I had to leave and as I was walking away, I then heard, I'll walk you home. Where do you live? Unfortunately, I really had nowhere else to go but home. Nobody else was around and it was way too early in the morning. My roommate was also back at his own house as he went back home every weekend. I had a hold of my keys in my pocket and just hoped that once I got into the building, I could hopefully find a way in without this guy being able to invite himself in. I refused to walk home but he followed me anyways, walking about 8-10 to 10 feet away from me as I was speeding up at this point, but then caught up as I crossed the road. I really don't know why but I decided to go the long way to get to my building and as I was approaching the flat, I felt this horrible sinking feeling deep in my chest. The door to the building closes really slow at first before slamming shut, so I knew even when I walked in he could potentially follow me inside and that puts me at an even greater risk. By this point he was pretty much begging me to let him inside. He said that he was extremely thirsty and he wanted some water but I told him that my roommate is sleeping. A subtle way to try and deter him by showing him I wasn't alone but that didn't seem to faze him. He was trying to be touchy and he just kept pleading with me to be let inside but I kept my ground. I kept telling him no as best as possible. As he was talking to me I managed to use my fob on the door and only open it enough to carefully slide through. However, he was right at the door and I didn't want to make him upset, so I then apologized and I told him no once again. Luckily, he had to move away from the door as someone wanted to get into the building. The guy that was entering the flat then asked me if everything was okay when he saw me, but really stupidly, I said everything was fine. That did give me a chance though to move away from the door and I let it close once the guy walked through. I didn't even look back to the guy once. I just ran up the stairs to my flat as fast as I could. I didn't get any sleep that night and from that moment on, I made sure to always have money aside for a taxi. I think I walked home maybe once more between June to October right before I moved. Really scary stuff and I'm really glad that I never saw him ever again after that. This all started about a year ago. I'm a 23 year old female and I live on the second floor of an apartment complex and I've lived here my entire life. The building is mostly compromised of families with young children as well as married couples. A lot of the families have lived here as long as my family has so everyone knows each other pretty well. There's only one apartment that isn't occupied by a family but rather by a pair of brothers who always keep to themselves. One day one of their sons around my age appeared out of the blue. He was really strange right off the bat. He would always wear a sweatshirt with the hood up and would run through the apartment complex to get to his apartment. I'm not really sure what his face looks like because he always had the hood over his face. He lived on the first floor and he would often get into his place by jumping through the window. He basically did everything in his power to avoid any kind of human interaction. I didn't really mind him because I never really saw him due to my busy schedule. However, one day he started sitting on the top of the staircase that leads to my apartment. This was pretty strange because his apartment unit was on the other side of the complex and on the first floor. I brushed it off at first but it started happening every day. When I would come home from school, he would always be there. When my boyfriend at the time would drop me off at night, typically around 10.30 to 11.00, he would be there. Sometimes when I would leave and come back hours later, he would still be in the same exact spot as if he didn't move throughout the 5 plus hours that I was gone. At that point, I decided to tell my parents and boyfriend about it and they became very vigilant. My boyfriend would park his car and walk me to my door every night that he dropped me off. Once he saw my boyfriend, it seemed like he stopped sitting on the staircase and I thought it was over. But of course, it wasn't. Then he started waiting for me at my bus stop. 
The bus that I take home from school stops right across the street from my home, so it's a really short walk. One day when I was getting off, I saw him waiting at the bus stop. Once he saw me get off, he followed me into the complex and sat on the staircase yet again. He would also start following me whenever I would walk my dog. At this point, my parents were getting really upset. My mom started telling the neighbors that he was following me around. My neighbors started to make sure that he wasn't bothering me, or if I was ever alone, they would start a conversation with me until I got into my door. Then one day, I got a friend request on Facebook from this guy. Mind you, he had never spoken a word to me, so I mean, how did he know my name, let alone find me on Facebook? My mom tried talking to his father, but they would never answer the door when my mom knocked on their door. So I'm thinking, I mean, it can't possibly get any worse, right? I mean, he seemed pretty harmless, so I wasn't too worried about it. I was wrong. One day when I returned to my boyfriend's house, my mom had told me that she had something to tell me, but she didn't want me to get spooked. She proceeded to tell me that when she was walking towards the kitchen to get a glass of water, she saw something in the tree begin to move. Now, our kitchen has a huge window that takes up most of the wall. In front of the window, there's this really huge tree. If someone were to climb the tree, you could see directly into our apartment. Well, guess what? When my mom took a closer look, she realized that my neighbor was sitting in the tree looking right into the apartment. My mom called my dad over and when my neighbor saw my dad, he jumped off the tree. At that moment, I felt like my peace had been stolen from me. We filed a police report, but when the police went looking for him, he was long gone. Apparently, there were snack wrappers and a hidden blanket in between the leaves of the trees. The police seemed to think that that wasn't the first time he was in the tree. I couldn't help but to wonder how many times he saw me walking around and I had no idea of it. It's been about six months and I haven't seen him since. His father still lives in the complex, but there's no sign of him. The police haven't been able to find him, so I have no idea what happened to him. But hopefully for me, I won't see him ever again. So this literally just happened about an hour ago, and my adrenaline is still pumping through the roof. Anyways, let's backtrack a bit. So I'm a 16 year old female and I live with my mom in a really tiny house. Our rooms are separated and mine is located just beside the dining area, while hers was near the living room. Anyway, my room is also beside the back door that leads into a patio into our backyard which is just right beside my room. Inside of my room is an air conditioning hole that has not been repaired and it's just being covered by a flimsy ass plywood. If you were to be outside, you'd be able to lift this plywood and peek right through to my room from the patio. This information is really important to the story, so just bear with me. Now, I've been noticing for the past couple of days that someone keeps flashing flashlights onto my window at 3am. I've told both my mother as well as the housekeeper all about this, but they told me that it's just the neighbor checking the chickens. They have chickens which are located near our backyard. But I mean, like at 3 a.m.? I don't think so. But anyways, I just shrugged it off and thought that it might have just been unintentional. I never really gave much thought about it because I mean, I never really met this neighbor and we've never really had an actual interaction before. One time though, I was hanging my clothes in the backyard when I saw him just staring directly at me. Like he literally just sat in his backyard and just stared at me. I got really weirded out and I was home alone at the time. Fortunately my mom arrived and I had to stop and help bring in the groceries. After those events, nothing really happened much. That is, until today. I was watching some military videos and live PD on my phone while I was lying on my bed, when I suddenly hear the plywood then begin to move. I paused the video to see what was going on when someone suddenly lifted the plywood, stuck their hand in, and then opened their freaking flashlight. I froze for a second, unable to process the situation I was in. I then totally snapped and then I screamed, what the hell? And then quickly opened my phone's flashlight. I pushed the plywood out and was expecting to see someone, but the person took off. 
I immediately turned on the lights and went into the kitchen to grab the largest knife that we had. At this point, my heart was beating so fast that I could feel the eardrums beating as well. I was cautious to open my back door, but I did it anyways. I was holding the knife really hard in my hand. I knew that I was going to get in real danger if this person decided to screw with me for real. I stood there breathing really heavily, and all that I saw was darkness. Until I saw that freaking neighbor walking with his flashlight pretending to check on his chickens at 4 a.m. He saw me, and then he immediately went back into his house. I was breathing really hard. I thought about barging into his house and killing him right on the spot, but I figured I'd just let the cops handle it if I ever decide to get the authorities involved. I'm still pretty shook up about it. I'm so mad. It really makes me wonder how many times he had done that without me knowing. How many times had he spied on me? It really makes my blood boil. It makes me mad. I was really scared, but I think my anger surpassed that. If this man does that one more time, I really don't know what I'm going to do. I just really hope that he doesn't. My mother and sister live in a quiet area of a small country town. Our entire family is a big lover of cats, so we've always had a lot of cats. Around May, my mother had about three of them. I'll refer to them as Cat A, Cat B, and Cat C. Cat A disappeared around the end of May. He was a bit dumb though, so we thought that maybe he got hit by a car somewhere. Cat B disappeared at the end of August. This one was very scared of cars and didn't ever go near them, and he never got very far from the house, so it was really weird to us. My mother was really hoping that someone else had adopted him by force so that he would be okay. My sister convinced my mother to adopt a new kitten in November. We'll call her Cat D. During this very same period, there were several other cats as well that disappeared in the neighborhood. As I said, it's a really small, quiet neighborhood with a lot of elderly people and cat owners. However, right before Christmas, two cats from the neighborhood were found dead. And on Christmas Day, my mother found her Cat C covered in blood along with another neighbor's cat in a plastic bag in the corner of her garden. The vets were able to determine that the cats had been killed by a large blow to the head, probably from a shovel or something. Four cats were found dead and straight up missing in one neighborhood in just a few months. My mother and the other neighbors began to realize that someone was doing this to the cats, and suspicions quickly turned to my mother's right neighbor. He's a man in his 50s and he was the last person to move into the neighborhood. It's not that uncommon to see him drunk and yelling with his drunk friends very late at night. And when I was at my mother's house for the summer, he made a lot of comments about my body to another neighbor. I've seen him be very aggressive and threatening with my mother over gutter issues. Most of all though, he always insists on having a perfect lawn, except that the neighborhood cats would come and defecate on it. He once told my mother and another neighbor that he was actually going to kill all of the cats, and that was literally right before all of the disappearances started. The place where my mother found her cat C in a plastic bag is a place that can only be accessed from that neighbor's garden, and when the police started making rounds in the neighborhood, he suddenly decided to clean out his entire garage and then got rid of this strange tarp and what he had been hiding under it for a few months. He also threatened my mother, and he also hasn't spoken to any of the neighbors since. Everyone in the neighborhood really thinks it was him, but unfortunately, we have no proof. The police summoned him, but can't really do anything more if he doesn't confess. My mother and sister were absolutely heartbroken when they realized that the three cats were probably killed by the very same despicable person. What really scares me though is knowing that a man like that an absolute psychopath who can kill cats in order to get a perfect lawn, lives very close to my family that my sister walks past his house every day on her way home from school. I'm really afraid that one day he'll get way too drunk and come after my family. As for the last kitten adopted by my mother, he can't go out of the garden by himself as my mother fears way too much for his life. Those cats were adorable. Knowing what happened to them absolutely disgusts me to no end. So to my neighbor's mother who probably did this to all of the cats, 
I don't have any proof that you did it, but I'm pretty damn sure. You're a terrible person. This happened about six months ago. I live in an apartment with four floors. There's a man that lives on the fourth floor. He's middle-aged. I've always only seen him around with his mom because she's the one who guides him around and usually doesn't leave him unattended. I notice that every time I see him, this man always has his eyes stuck on me. Literally, once he sees me, there's no looking away. He has the creepiest stare I've ever seen. Fast forward to the day where I felt the most vulnerable. I was walking up to my apartment complex. Usually the walk is a bit long. Once I'm a couple steps from my door, I noticed a familiar face. Yes, it was him. He was alone this time, which made me kind of scared, not really knowing what he would do. He just stared at me from the moment that he saw me to the moment I closed the door and then I locked it behind me. Five minutes passed by and I'm in my room just eating and I then hear my mom talking to someone in the living room. I walk out and it was him. Why the hell did my mom think that it was okay to let this strange guy in our house? I just really don't know. Apparently he was ringing the doorbell nonstop until he got someone's attention, which happened to be my mom's. My mom opened the door and asked what he wanted. Then he shoves my mom, pushes the door open, walks in, and then points to my room, then saying, My girlfriend. My girlfriend's in there. Which was really creepy that he knew exactly which room to point to. My mom proceeded to tell him that no one was home at the moment. In that moment, my sister heard him and then walked out. My sister kicked him out of the house immediately. A couple of minutes pass by and he's ringing the doorbell again non-stop. This later goes on for an another annoying two hours. With the doorbell constantly ringing, every now and then my sister would look into the peephole. This man has his whole face in the peephole and is laughing to himself while my sister is just cursing him out on the other side. He bangs the door here and there but is constantly being creepy through the peephole. Every other time that we would look into the peephole, he either has his head down, his face in the peephole, or him walking back and forth and laughing at himself. This proceeds for a while until I call the cops. And you know how that goes. I called three times and waited for about two hours waiting on the other side of the door so this man would leave. Well, the cops didn't do crap. I haven't seen this man since, but I'm still pretty scared of any future encounters. I never want to experience this again. My parents had shared custody of me until my dad started working away, so I then moved in with my mom. She lived about two hours away from where I lived with my dad in a pretty crappy suburb. Plenty of junkies and alcoholics. I was around 12 to 13 years old at the time, maybe younger. The man in this story will call Craig. Craig was my neighbor. My house was at the end of the road, then an empty house, then Craig's house. Craig's house was about the same size as ours, but he had about 10 people living there. They were aboriginals, so it's not that unusual to have so many people living in a small house. It was about 8.30 p.m. and one of my small dogs had gotten out of the house and ran down the road. So me, being the good fur mom that I am, I went out to look for him. I called him for a few times until I started to panic. Craig sat on his lawn drinking with plenty of empty bottles right beside him. I was on my lawn when he then stood up and he was in the center of his lawn, so the lawn of the vacant house then separated us. Craig waved at me and he told me to come closer, so I did. I walked a little closer and he told me that he had my small dog in his backyard and if I didn't hurry up and come get him, he was going to kill it. I was in shock, so I walked a little closer. One of the neighbors had actually saw this and they told me to get away from him. I snapped out of it and basically ran inside right into my house. What had actually happened was my dog had basically done a lap around the neighborhood and then came right up next to our house. Then he dug under the fence and into the backyard. One of the other neighbors heard him bark so she asked the others if I was still looking for him. And that's when she saw Craig trying to lure me into his backyard. So did the really creepy old man who told me he was going to kill my dog and also tried to lure me into his backyard. I hope you freaking die.
So I grew up in Texas, and if you know anything about living in a small town like I did, you'll know that everyone knows everyone else. And of course, this was very true for my community, all except for my next door neighbors. Now I say next door, but what I really mean is that they were a ways away. We lived on a farm and our neighbors were down the creek around 500 feet. They were a somewhat mysterious group. It was a man and a wife and two kids. They stayed mostly to themselves, occasionally driving their old Chevrolet pickup down the old gravel road every week to the general store. There were a few trees between the property lines separating us from them, but inside of my bedroom, if I ever laid on my bed a certain way, I could see the far off lighting coming from their back porch. Now for the creepy part. It was 11 o'clock at night, almost midnight. Me being around 10 years old at the time, I really loved to stay up and read science fiction. So I'm sitting there reading my novel and everyone's asleep, and I see an abnormal light coming from where I would usually see the neighbor's porch. I thought nothing of it and just went back to reading. Minutes later, I hear chanting. Now I'm totally freaking out. In our area, you never hear anything like this, and I certainly never heard it before. This is the moment where I should have woken up my papa, but being a stupid kid, I ran to get a better look through the kitchen window. What I saw next totally frightened me beyond belief. Standing right there in my neighbor's yard was a group of six men with all white robes, and they were circling a burning cross. The way the light hit their clothing, the embers were coming off, and it absolutely terrified me. I ran to get my papa. He got quite a scare as well from me abruptly waking him up. He immediately grabbed the shotgun that he had to his side. I then ran to show him what I had found. He called the sheriff and about 10 minutes later, he showed up at our door. He said that he couldn't really do anything about it and they had the freedom to do what they wanted. So pretty much, we had to just deal with it. It eventually stopped around dawn. I pretty much got no sleep the rest of the night or the next few nights. About a week later, we received a letter that showed up at our door. I distinctly remember that it was written in Latin. We had it translated and this is what it said. We're watching you. Always. To this day, I'm still absolutely terrified and I don't know what to do. But I'm really hoping and praying they're not going to harm me and my family. I got off work and I went to my mom's to help her and my dad set up their new Alexa TV they just got. It ended up taking quite a while because we had to run to the store to grab an adapter, so I didn't leave their house until about 8pm and by the time I got home it was pretty close to 9pm and pitch black. I have my hands full of a few things that I forgot at my parents since I stayed with them for about a month before I found my place. Anyway. I was walking up the sidewalk to my apartment when I then hear a voice calling out to me. Hey, excuse me, hello, hey. He was politely persistent. I had one headphone in and I was listening to YouTube and trying to pretend like I didn't hear him. Not to be rude because it's pitch black outside and I've been up since 6am and I'm dead tired. I don't really like small talk and I'm pretty bad at it. Eventually I turn around and we're pretty much forced to introduce ourselves. Immediately the hairs on my arms then prickle and I get this weird feeling in my gut. This guy is sizing me up. I can tell. He wants to know where I live to see if he can break into my place and rob me. I don't know how to explain it but it was something that I just know. It's not even a feeling. It's a fact. The entire time that we're talking, maybe about 10 minutes. He has his hands in his pocket, his hood up, and he keeps looking around like he's expecting to see someone. Granted, it is cold, but we live in Arizona, so it's not that cold, but this also really puts me on edge. Then he begins asking about me. How long ago I moved in, which unit I'm in, etc. I mean, he's obviously going to see which unit I'm in when I walk into it, so I just tell him. He makes small talk for a couple of minutes with me, then he asks if it's just me. I explain. Oh no, I've got my two dogs. I then go on to tell him how big they are and how protective they are, and how they're freely roaming in my apartment when I'm at work. 
which is all true. He asked if I take them on walks and how often. Then he said this, How often do you leave your apartment empty? I then explained that I have to be very careful because while my dogs do love me and they act like really big babies with me, they're very protective. So anytime we go out is a pretty big challenge because I have to be careful of the people coming up to us as well as how my dogs react to them. I decide to turn the conversation around and ask him the same questions that he asked me. Which unit he's in, how long he's been there, who he lives with, etc. He seems really uncomfortable and gives me really vague answers waving his hand behind him and then saying, Oh, that one over there. He seems pretty uncomfortable about me trying to clarify on which apartment he's in. So he tapers off the conversation and we say our goodbyes. I unlock my door, give my dogs a command to bark, which they do, and it's very loud and vicious sounding. I immediately give them love and then call my mom. I give her the guy's name, what he looks like, his vague betrayal at what apartment he's in and reminder of our panic phrase, so if I ever say it, she knows to calmly end the call and send the police. Now I'm just sitting in my apartment, freaking out at literally every little sound, all the while my dogs are piled on top of me while I'm typing this out. I think I'm going to call the non-emergency police and ask them to do a drive-by to make me feel safer. I'm really scared. So, the story happened to me around eight years ago. I lived in a cheap apartment complex with three other apartments on my floor. I lived on the third floor. Of these three neighbors, I partially knew one of them. He was some young dude who used to work out at the same gym as me. But the one next to me really creeped me out. It was an older grumpy guy who never talked to anyone. Sometimes I would watch him searching through our trash but never found out what he was looking for or why he did it. One night at around 11 p.m., I heard some really loud noises which sounded like someone was coughing to death and it was at the grumpy man's place. I got up and I knocked on his door asking if everything's okay. I then heard someone approaching the door. The old dude then yelled from behind the door something along the lines of, What the hell do you want? He had a really strong accent so I barely understood him. I asked if he needed some help or if he wanted me to call an ambulance, as I had heard him coughing through my wall. The only thing I got back was, I'm fine. Screw off. I got really annoyed and went back to bed. At least no one was coughing the rest of the night. After this night, he started watching me through his window every time I went outside to have a smoke. When I finally got my degree, I decided to move back to my parents. Like I said, it was a pretty crappy place, and the guy next to me really creeped me the crap out, so I just really wanted to stay out of there. A couple of years later, I ran into the dude that I used to go to the gym with. He told me that the creepy old man had actually strangled a prostitute in his apartment, and according to him, he hid the body in his closet. He tried to dispose of the body near the woods at the apartment, but he pretty much immediately got busted. I found out later that he originally came from South Africa, where he sat in prison for about 10 years. Apparently he was in for carjacking and almost killing someone. I often refuse to talk about this because I'm still shivering whenever I think back to when I lived in that crappy apartment. I'm really glad I got out of there when I did. And to that really creepy old man who killed someone. I really hope that you rot in prison and I never see you ever again. I recently bought a very run-down fixer-upper in a city in a more rural area about an hour from where I live. Next door to me lives a couple, maybe in their late 40s with their two young kids. If I had to guess, I'd think one was maybe one and the other was three years old. For the first few weeks, I assumed the man was divorced as I never ever saw his wife there. Even now, I've only seen her about twice in three months. At the beginning, when I first started fixing up the house, he was your typical friendly neighbor character, offering to lend me tools and giving me slightly overbearing but really good advice. I never really thought anything of it, until it seemed I saw more and more of him with each visit. Every time I was there, he would kind of saunter over for no reason at all. 
We do share a driveway, so this isn't overly strange, but it often seemed like whenever I was outside, he would suddenly pop out of his house and find a reason to chat with me. Now, I'm not a flirt, and I don't look like Marilyn Monroe, but I do think that he thinks I'm much younger than him, hence the slightly overbearing demeanor. However, I do really like my quiet time and privacy, and one of the reasons why I really like DIY is because I do it alone, and it gives me time to think. Today, things got really weird. I've pretty much been seeing him virtually every single time that I came to the house, so I was already sort of dreading coming out to try and finish the renovation ASAP. For the very first time, I actually parked my car around the corner, with the excuse that I was leaving that space free for the gas company who were coming later that day. The car was out of sight and I'd let the gas man in quietly through the front door. And afterwards, I was just doing some more quiet work, like painting. I was already hiding from him in my own house. Then I hear knocking on the back door. I peek out a side window and I then see him there with his daughter. I'm a little surprised that he even knew I was there, but for once, I decided not to open it like I usually would. I just really didn't want to be friendly with him as much anymore. He goes away. Maybe about 15 minutes later, I'm happily painting away when I hear another knocking on the back door. I ignore it yet again. Then he comes around to the front door, rings the doorbell once, then immediately begins to pound on the quite fragile door. I could absolutely scream at this point. It was the kind of bashing that said, I know you're there and I will not be ignored. Really freaking aggressive and quite alarming. So of course, I now have no choice but to answer the damn door, since it really did sound like he was going to break it. He's there and without his daughter and he invites me over for some lunch. Well, this is a first, and though I know it might be rude to say no, I made the excuse that I was vegetarian and that he'd probably made a meat dish, which he had. He was frowning and he said all this weird crap and it really set alarm bells off in my head. He's never invited me to lunch before, and even though he had a young daughter with him, I just felt like it was some kind of a weird trap, at least in my head anyways. Then he said while still frowning, I'll see you later. And not in a casual, see ya if I see ya tone, but a, I plan to see you no matter what kind of way. He actually nodded to himself as he said it. So, I don't really know if he's just overbearing or he's being a total creep. All I know is I definitely feel creeped out. I think I'm just going to do my best to continue avoiding him, and I really hope he'll leave me alone. My children and I live in an apartment complex. A refugee family has moved into a unit at the end of the hall. There's four adults and three children. My daughter is about six years old and has made friends with the young girls in this family and she spends a lot of time playing with them. There's a bit of a language barrier with the adults, so we usually communicate with them through the children who then translate for us. The adults speak some English, but not very much at all. I'm not sure how to handle the situation since I can't really speak to the parents directly because of the language barrier. So here's what happened. A couple of days ago, my daughter was outside playing Barbies with the girls. They were sitting in the grass nearby the girls' patio. One of the adult men came out and looked directly at my daughter and then said, Nice, beautiful. With a really creepy smile. So, maybe it was just a compliment, and if so, there's no harm in that. But, well, yesterday my daughter and I, we rode a bus home from a shopping trip. When we exited the bus, she ran ahead of me since I had packages that were slowing me down. She was probably about 20 feet in front of me when the same man was driving down the road. He saw my daughter and slowed down, creeping along next to her with a frighteningly creepy grin, nodding his head. It was the way that a grown man lustfully looks at a grown woman that he wants to pounce. It was absolutely sickening the way that he was looking at my daughter. I was literally watching him the whole time, and without taking my eyes off of this creep, I called my daughter's name. Startled, he looked up at me and then suddenly sped up and continued down the road. He was so focused on looking at her that he didn't even notice that I was not too far behind her. 
She's only six years old. I'm beyond creeped out and absolutely disgusted over this. I'm not even sure what to do other than keep my daughter away from that family. I mean, I can't really make a report until he does something like trying to lure her. I've had an intense talk with her about stranger danger and what to do if he approaches her. Maybe I'm overthinking this, but that gut feeling of fear and disgust that I got when I saw his facial expressions, well, it's telling me he didn't have innocent thoughts when he was looking at my daughter. I honestly just really don't know what to do. I'm going to do my best to keep this creepy man away from my daughter. If he knows what's good for him, he'll stay the hell away. We've lived in our neighborhood for nearly four years. A few houses down and across the street is a Filipino family. They're pretty nice and whenever we see each other we always have small talk and we know each other by name. We moved in right before I gave birth to my oldest so they always ask for the baby and they love seeing them. We have even had meals at each other's homes before. This summer, they had an older family member, maybe 55 to 60 years old, come to visit. We noticed him right away because he would always go for long walks and lingered a lot. One evening, the mother of the family introduced him as her father. He had recently moved and would be staying with them for a while before heading north to her sister's house. He was pretty new to the US and spoke a little English. Just enough to get by. He seemed nice enough, but as soon as we walked inside, I told my husband that he gave me a really weird vibe. I had never felt that way of any of the seven other family members from the home. I've been in their home and shared meals with them. They're very sweet and welcoming. My husband also told me that he did seem a little off, but we just chalked it up to cultural differences. Fast forward about a month. My mother-in-law and my mother came to visit at the very same time. They're in the driveway with our son. I run inside because I'm pregnant and I suffer from severe morning sickness. I come back out 15 minutes later and they're having a frustrating conversation with this man. He was trying to get one of them to drive him to the store and he would use a food stamp slash EBD card to buy their groceries and wanted them to give him cash. They both told him that they weren't interested, but he just kept asking and lingering. When I went outside, I called out to my husband to come out, and when he saw us, he walked away very quickly. Both of our mothers told us what had happened and how forceful that he was being with them. The next few days that I see him walking, we always wave and say simple pleasantries, but every time I would wave, he would take it as a sign to come over and try to have a conversation. I began to let him know that what he did with our mothers is very illegal and to be so forceful was really unnecessary. He said that he understood, but he would linger. It would always be at a moment where I was trying to strap my toddler to his car seat and I was rushing to get him to school. It would always take me about 10 minutes to get him to get the hint that I couldn't talk and he would slowly walk away and just linger in our driveway. It eventually got to the point where I would watch to see if he'd walk past our house on his morning walk before venturing outside. I really just hated the awkward conversation. He would always seem to round the corner just as I finished strapping my son in the car and I was getting in. I would wave and then jump in quickly and drive off. It just felt really off. Like he was waiting for me. One of our neighbors across the street one night told me that she got a weird vibe from him as well. And again, he always lingered. She told me that he did similar things with her when they were outside as well. They were opting to hang in the backyard with the kids just to avoid it altogether. Now, I usually work from home, but one day I went into the office and I was then alerted by the ring camera. This man was standing and looking in through our kitchen window just peering and I could hear our pit bull barking at him. When he saw our dog, he jumped back and I used the microphone to say, Can I help you? What do you want? He looked absolutely shocked and then scurried away. I called my husband and I told him to play the video. We both thought it was really creepy. 
Whenever we saw the family walking that evening, we decided to bring it up to his daughter. She spoke to her father and he claimed that it never happened. We then showed her the video on her phone and he said that he must have gotten lost. The daughter seemed pretty annoyed by him and the entire situation. So him being weird kind of calmed down a bit after that I could see that his daughter was really annoyed by his behavior. And as they were walking, there was a really heated conversation. She later told me that he tends to be overly friendly and he really means no harm, but she talked to him and he would leave us alone. I asked if he had some kind of mental issue or maybe Alzheimer's since he was always getting lost. She told me no and that he had always acted like that and that she couldn't wait until her sister was ready for him to be sent up north to her. There were a few other neighbors that had also complained to her and the homeowners association as well. Well, about two months later, I drop my son off to preschool. I get home and I have to rush in because I feel really sick. Usually I leave my car door open, but something told me to lock it as soon as I got out. I did so as I was rushing inside. I would also normally leave the door unlocked if I was just going for a quick throw up session, but again, my instincts told me to lock the bottom and top lock. When I was in the bathroom, right by the front door, throwing up my life, I then hear a rattling at the front door. Someone is turning the lock back and forth. Of course, my ring chimes and I then look at it in between heaves. What do you know? It's the old man and he's trying to get into our home. I go over to the microphone and then say, You're at the wrong house. To which he responds with, let me in, now. I want to tell you something. Now, I kid you not, it was the best English sentence I had ever heard from someone who wasn't that good with English. I started to feel better pretty quickly and I was now on high alert. I responded with, What do you want to tell me? He looked right at the camera. Let me in your house, now! This is where I started to panic. He knew he was at the wrong house, but still, he was continuing to try and break in. I respond, Please get off my property. I don't feel comfortable with you here, and I'm not letting you in my house. He then starts rattling at the door again really hard and tries to pull it open, and then starts knocking on the bathroom window. This is where I get pissed. Get the hell off my damn property right now. I'm not going to let you in. If you don't get the hell out of here right now, I'm calling the cops. He then steps back, gives the camera the middle finger, and scurries off. He disappears and I run upstairs and see that he's simply walking back to his house. I let our pit bull out of our bedroom as he had been going crazy during this whole ordeal. I call my husband and he tells me to call the daughter and tell her what happened. I call her and I tell her what happened and she told me not to let him in, ever. She began to warn me that he's been very inappropriate and forceful with all of the women in her family and she didn't want me to get hurt, especially being pregnant. She eventually comes over about an hour later and I show her the video. She's absolutely fuming over this and very apologetic and she begs me not to call the cops. She promises me he'll be gone within the next day. The next day, he eventually flies out and his daughter told him that he's no longer welcome in her home. He now lives up north somewhere in Maryland with his other daughter and probably harassing other people as well. I honestly really don't know what would have happened if I didn't follow my instincts that day. I'm just really glad I'm okay. This story happened to me when I was in third grade. I was about 8 years old at the time. My regular babysitter was ill so my mom asked one of our neighbors who had kids and babysit a lot of the neighborhood kids if she would watch my brother and I for a few hours. We were having so much fun at Brandy's house when my mom came to pick us up. I asked if I could stay a little bit longer and finish Madagascar as we had just started watching it. She said that it was fine but I was to walk straight home right after. It was like maybe half a block, so not that far at all. So as the movie finishes, Brandy said that I needed to get home really fast because it was dark out. As I'm walking home, this other neighbor, Dennis, is just standing outside in his front yard. 
Now, I had seen Dennis around the neighborhood because his wife was very unforgettable looking. They have a daughter that was like maybe four-ish at the time, so I did never play with her or know her family outside of seeing them around the neighborhood. Dennis starts calling out to me, saying, Hey, what are you doing? I'm just going to my parents. Do you want to come inside for a little bit? No, that's okay. My mom told me to come straight home. Aw, oh, come on. I'm sure she wouldn't mind. Uh, no thanks. Come on. I have a daughter who would absolutely love to play with you. We can even make snacks. At this point, I was just like, red flag, abort mission, and I started booking it home really fast. Then he starts following me. Not quickly, just kind of walking like Michael Myers. It was creepy. Luckily, I eventually made it home, and once he saw that I was approaching my house with my porch light on, he completely backed off. I'd like to mention that behind our houses was a giant wooded area with paths that led to a nearby lake. So, I mean, this dude could have caught me and dragged me into the woods or something. I try not to think like that, but like, what other motives could he have had, you know? Fast forward until I'm in high school and working at a restaurant in town. I see creepy Dennis and his wife all the time. As it turns out, they were secret shoppers at our restaurant. I don't think he really recognized me working there though. Anyways, I know this isn't your typical horror story of someone getting dragged into the woods. But still, as a child this was a very creepy experience to go through. If you're a young child walking home alone, always watch your surroundings. You just never know. So, about a year ago, my apartment complex decided that they wanted to renovate my unit, so I had to move out at the end of my lease. I live in Denver and my rent is pretty ridiculous here. So, I started worrying about finding something affordable in my neighborhood, which I really love. I posted on the Nextdoor app to see if anyone in my neighborhood knew of any affordable rentals in the area. I immediately got a message from someone named Joe who said that one of the condos in his complex was going to be up for rent pretty soon, and he knew the owner. He offered to get me in touch with the owner. I asked if he could send me pictures of the unit, and he asked if he could text me some pictures that his neighbor took because the chat function on the app is really slow. I now feel really stupid for doing this, but eventually gave him my phone number. I kid you not, I received a phone call from an unknown number within seconds. Now, I normally don't answer calls from unknown numbers, but I was expecting a call from a number that wasn't saved in my phone, so I answered it. I was completely bewildered when the person then said, Hi, it's Joe. How's your day going? Huh? It really took me by surprise and I didn't really know what to say. He started to just shoot the crap on the phone, talking about how he works nights and how tired he is and how he takes care of his daughter while his girlfriend works during the day. I finally interrupted and then said, So, about the condo? He pretty much completely disregarded that and then said, I really don't think that my girlfriend would appreciate me talking to you, but I don't have to tell her, right? I said that I have to go and then immediately hung up the phone. And as soon as I did, he then started texting me. It was really bizarre and quite alarming to me. I blocked his number and then moments later, he found me on Facebook and sent me a friend request. Now, I'm 32 years old, but it was really creepy to me, and I even called my parents to tell them about it, and just how unnerved that it made me. And the worst part about it is that on next door, even if your exact address isn't listed, your complex is. So, I was pretty certain that I didn't have my address visible in my profile, but I checked, and sure enough, my address and unit number were totally public. Unable to really contact me in any other way, he started messaging me again on Nextdoor, asking me if I wanted to go on a walk with him. You can't really block or report people on the app, so I just decided to delete it. So one night about a month or so later, I had a knock on my door at around 10pm on a weeknight. I looked out my peephole but couldn't really get a good look. 
I saw that it was a man who slightly had his head down. Either way, I don't answer the door for anyone that I'm not expecting, especially not a random guy at 10 o'clock at night. Feeling panicked, I decided to call my neighbor across the hall. She's an older woman and we always look out for each other since we both live alone. I asked her if it looked like he was some kind of delivery guy at the wrong door. She opened her door to try and get a good look at the guy and that spooked him because he literally ran away. I honestly have no idea if this was the next door guy or not, but my gut tells me that it was. This was a big wake up call. I always felt that I practiced good online safety, but I didn't even know that my address was visible on next door. I'll never be that casual or lazy about privacy settings like that ever again. I'm 28 years old, but when I was about 5 years old, my mom and I lived in this duplex that was off a main road and kind of in a wooded area. We lived on one side and the other was a woman and her son. He was studying to be a teacher. My mother had me pretty young so she was about 25 years old and the guy was in his early 20s. He would often come and talk to my mom. My mother said that he would ask a lot of questions about me and ask my mother if it would be alright for him to take me for walks in the woods. Of course, my mother always declined. My mother worked in the operating room at the local hospital and was on call a lot, so most of the weekends I stayed at my grandma's house. One night while I was at my grandma's house, my mom was home alone, sleeping. She woke in the middle of the night and said she doesn't remember if she heard something or felt someone in the room, but she woke up. She could see feet wearing socks that were sticking out from the end of her bed. She grabbed her bedside lamp and was about to hit the intruder when our neighbor then yelled her name and then said his name. He couldn't really explain why he was naked and only wearing socks, but he begged my mother not to tell his mother about it. My mother of course called the cops. She ended up going to court and making a victim impact statement against this guy because she was absolutely terrified that he'd become a teacher and be around children. She says that she's pretty sure that he was there for me that night and was so happy that I wasn't there. We ended up moving pretty much immediately after that happened. She just couldn't stay another night in that house. I'm just really glad that nothing happened to me or my mother. Who really knows what would have happened if he would have succeeded in whatever he was trying to do that night. So, this happened about 4 years ago. I'm 21 years old and no longer living in the neighborhood. I saw the neighbor in question yesterday when I was visiting my parents and that's when I remembered what had happened. A little bit of backstory. I live in a third world country. Our neighborhood is one of the worst ones but only for outsiders. We're actually pretty friendly towards each other. Even people fresh out of jail are typically pretty friendly. We got a lot of mental cases in our neighborhood, and Happy is one of them. My mother and I call him Happy because his name literally means happy, and we always joke around saying, Oh, Happy, are you happy? Because he's usually always smiling. That is, unless someone angers him, which is at least three times a year. I lived there for about 19 years, so I know how he is. Happy lives with his two brothers. One sells fruits and the other is a taxi driver. Happy doesn't work because he's mentally ill. I think he has some type of schizophrenia but I'm not really sure which one. All I know is he just doesn't really function right. You can't really hold a conversation with him on sports or the news or really anything. His sentences just never make sense. I should also say that our country doesn't really take mental illnesses very seriously. We've got like three psych wards in the entire country. There's just no way of treatment for him. And whatever he is, people just refer to him as crazy. It's honestly really sad. My dad was actually friends with him and his brothers. Not anymore though. My dad used to give him money from time to time so that he could buy himself smokes. My dad knew that his brother, the taxi driver, needed to support his two kids in another city and the fruit seller barely sells his goods. 
Happy used to help carry the groceries sometimes and Dad would give him some change for it. So, since I was a kid, I only know the Happy who was very helpful and friendly, and I always smiled at him, and he would smile back at me. Well, when I turned 15 years old, he had completely changed. He still had the smile on his face, and he would stand outside in different places in the shade all day long smoking. I used to wake up at about 7am to go to school, and I would see him outside wide awake just smoking. He either didn't sleep or just woke up way too early. He would also walk some long distances as well. We would see him in a place where it takes us about half an hour to go by car, so imagine how long it took him by foot to get there. He seemed restless, but mostly he would just stand there and smoke. It ranged from early mornings to very late at nights. The behavior change became pretty creepy. He would always stare at me and have a creepy kind of forced smile on his face. If I passed by him, he would always follow me with his eyes, to the point that he would walk backwards and keep staring. I glanced a couple of times to know that he does this every time. He would also walk backwards and then put his back up against the walls like he was hiding or something. His whole demeanor just totally changed. His anger and fits also became more frequent. He would shout some cursing phrases that made no sense whatsoever and walk angrily towards his house. Now to what actually happened to me. As I said, he would always follow me with his eyes and all that. I was 17 years old and out of any day, the day of the incident that I happened to be home alone. I didn't go out with the family because I had to study. He probably knew that I was alone because whenever my family left, I saw through the window that he was standing in his usual spot and just staring at them while they were driving off. Lunchtime came, so I went to go buy some stuff to cook. I spotted him standing next to his brother that sells the fruit at the local market. I went to the market to buy some veggies and meat. The vegetables were pretty close to where Happy was, but the butcher was a minute walk away. As I paid the butcher for my purchase and putting it into my bag, I look up and there Happy was just staring at me. I didn't really think much of it, so I turned to the right and just kept walking towards the house, but he was right behind me yet again. I still didn't think much of it, again, because our houses are literally right next to each other. I passed his house and I was waiting to hear his footsteps to stop, but no. He was still right behind me. I look and his eyes are still on me with that really creepy smile. Still, I didn't really care because I just thought that he was going right to his spot that he usually stands at to light a cigarette or something. I never really felt like I was in any danger in my neighborhood, so I'm not really the type to get anxious easily, and especially by happy. I never really felt that he was the dangerous type even during his rage fits, so that's why I really had no red flags. I entered the main door from the street and walked in the wide rectangular hall that had one door where an old woman lives, passing her door and turning right to climb the stairs to get to my house that was on the second floor. I heard someone enter the main door and in the hall. Again, I just thought it was one of the neighbors from the third floor. The footsteps were really quick though, so I thought that one of them was in a hurry, so I turned to look at the bottom of the stairs to see who it was and make some room so that they could climb fast. To my shock, it was none other than Happy on the bottom of the stairs. I stopped dead in my tracks and that's when my heart just started pounding really fast. I said, Happy, what are you doing here? With no response, he started bolting right towards me, taking two steps at a time. I started climbing faster too and he caught my foot and I slipped. My right arm and knee were in so much pain from the fall. He was dragging me to the bottom of the stairs and that messed up my back as well. But with all the adrenaline pumping through my veins, I started kicking to release my ankle from his two hands and then screaming for him to get off. I also screamed out help, hoping one of the neighbors would hear me and come for my rescue. With my free leg, I started kicking his forearm so that he would let go and then kept kicking and shaking the other leg free as well. With a bit of luck, I finally got free. I couldn't turn though and I started climbing afraid that he would follow to the house and God only knows what he would do if he got inside. 
I really just wanted to kick him and hopefully make him just lose balance and fall off the stairs to give me enough time to go inside my house. I kicked and kicked but with no luck and screaming. It felt like forever but it was probably about 5 seconds and I then heard the door of the old lady downstairs begin to open. Happy heard it too so he fled out of there. Happy passed her house so of course she saw him and she actually shouted at him but he didn't listen. She was calling my name and asking if I'm okay but I couldn't respond. She popped her head up from the bottom of the stairs still calling my name but all I could really do was just cry in terror and pain. My elbow was bleeding and she started calling for my mom's name. I told her that nobody was home so she asked me to get in her house so she could help take care of my bleeding. I told her it was okay and that I'd just do it myself but she refused and kept calling me to go down but eventually I just ignored her and hardly climbed those stairs and got inside. After about an hour or so, I got myself cleaned up, calmed down a bit and cautiously went to the old lady's house. I knocked and she opened and I asked her not to tell anything to my parents because if my dad knew he would probably literally kill the guy. I told her that Happy was just crazy and my dad shouldn't go to jail for someone who's crazy and he probably wasn't in his right mind. I eventually talked her into believing that he was out of his mind and that it's not that serious. She promised that she wouldn't say anything to my family and that was that. The next two years he changed again completely. This time however he wouldn't even look me in the eyes. If I was walking and he was walking towards me, he would literally turn around and not pass near me. The first couple of months I was really afraid that he would be waiting around a corner or something, but turns out he just doesn't want to be seen by me. Even after me moving out and us not seeing each other whenever I visit, and to this day, four years later, he still doesn't want to be seen by me. So happy. I hope you stay that way and don't hurt any other girls from the neighborhood. But what I really hope for the most is mental illness awareness in my country. I really hope that people start getting treatments and the right care. People like Happy really need it. I used to live in an apartment complex on the first floor. I had one person right next door named Joe and two more neighbors that were adjacent. I had met my next door neighbor when he had knocked on my door as the sun was setting. He was plump, brown hair with a bowl cut, glasses, and a button down shirt. He had told me that he had been knocking on doors and asking if someone could babysit his dog for the weekend since he was allegedly being called away for a last minute work trip. I agreed to watch his dog and only thinking of possible problems that might arise with his dog, I asked for his number, simply stating, you know, just in case. That was a major mistake on my part. I didn't really realize it then, obviously. I was really just trying to be a good neighbor. We had a short conversation about my love for video games and playing Dungeons and Dragons and it seemed like we had a lot of mutual interests. I was just being friendly, nothing more. I had my wedding ring on and made sure to brush my hand across my face to make sure that he could see it. My husband was deployed at the time. I didn't really think anything of it. Joe came back on Monday morning and I handed him his key. I hadn't asked for any money but he offered to pay me back in another way. Apparently his office was having an escape the room event and he was allowed to bring a friend. I agreed because, I mean, why not? He seemed like a really cool person that could potentially become a new friend for me. When the day came, I wasn't really feeling very well. I was cuddling on the couch wrapped up in blankets with my sweet little cockapoo named Cortana. I was really sick and hadn't been able to make it into work that day, so I sent Joe a text letting him know that I wouldn't be able to make it to the event and to not worry about paying me back. Joe's response? Uh, okay. I didn't respond. I fell asleep. I started getting text messages from him over the next several weeks but the context didn't really add up until the very end. He had texted me asking me why I hadn't invited him to play Dungeons and Dragons. How did he know that I was currently playing? 
My only explanation was that he must have heard me talking about it out in the hallway as I was leaving with my friend. Things started to get a little strange from here on out. Just beyond his door is a really nice sized patch of grass where I would take Cortana out to use the bathroom. She's usually a pretty mild mannered dog, sniffing everything on the ground and never really bothering to look up whenever she's exploring and focusing on going to the bathroom. Cortana suddenly started to turn towards the window where the blinds had been closed all the way and then started barking absolutely hysterically. I was really embarrassed about it. Since when did Cortana act like that? I would pull her and command her to hush, but to no avail. Every day that I went to that patch of grass in the afternoon, she would consistently bark to that window like a maniac. I eventually started taking her somewhere else to see if it would change, and it did. I went back after about a week and found out that the blinds were pulled all the way to the top. The window opened and Joe popped his torso all the way out, stretching his arms to the sky. My first initial thought was just, who does that? I say an awkward hello and then hurry Cortana along and back into our apartment. Someone begins to knock on my door like every other day. I become deadly quiet and tiptoe to the door to see that it's none other than Joe just standing there, peering intently into the peephole. I don't open the door. It happens again about three more times and every time the house becomes quiet. A little bit of time goes by and I then receive a text message from Joe offering to take me out to dinner. I'm absolutely perplexed, staring at the message and not really knowing what to say back. Not even three minutes go by and he sends another message. You know, I'm just trying to be friendly after you ditched me last time. Sorry for being friendly. I should have taken a picture of my face at the time because the shock must have been so great that Cortana sat up just to stare at me. Let me be very clear, I'm kind of a busy woman, I have a lot going on in my life. I don't usually text people back immediately like ever. I was pretty freaked out by that point and decided to call my mom and tell her what happened. I felt really unsafe in my own home at that point and I honestly really didn't know what to do. What if this dude decides to try and break into my apartment and attack me, and all because I supposedly ditched him and felt too sick to go to an escape the room event? My mom said to let him know very firmly that my husband wouldn't appreciate me having dinner with another man, and that his behavior was really inappropriate. For some reason, it took me mentioning my husband for Joe to back off. Not me ignoring him or avoiding him or practically running to my car whenever I heard his door open. Even after that, Cortana would still turn to the window and growl. I eventually moved out of that apartment and never heard from Joe ever again after that. And let's keep it that way. Last year, after a blissful first year of living in a new apartment all on my own for the very first time, a man had moved in next door that I will never forget. The layout of the apartment is really crucial to understanding this incident. The most important part is that my balcony and his balcony are only partially separated by a wall. There's a solid two foot gap in which you can easily walk from one to the other. For some context, I had previously had a very lovely woman living next door for the entire first year that I lived there, who never ever crossed this balcony threshold without being explicitly invited. I only throw this in there so that you can understand that I wasn't previously concerned about someone infiltrating my space. The first time that I met this new neighbor, he was unloading his groceries from his massive truck into the assigned parking spot right next to mine. As I was driving up, he and a girl that I assumed to be his girlfriend were unloading boxes from Costco. I noticed them speaking and as soon as I was out of the car, they went silent. I nodded to them, proceeded to my elevator, and then the guy ran up behind me, threw some boxes down, and begged me to wait. No problem. I mean, I'm a good neighbor. While in the elevator, the girlfriend absolutely refused to make eye contact or even speak to me, but he quickly introduced himself and he was extremely chatty. Now, in the 45 seconds where it takes to get to the floor where our apartments were, he asked me how I liked the place, where I was from, and where I worked. 
Now, looking back, his enthusiasm was a little strange, but I just chalked it up to him being excited to be in a new place. For the sake of the rest of the story, let's call him Sam. Sam was 33 years old, 6 foot tall, and with a slim muscular build, and had his hair buzzed extremely short, as if to mask his balding or something. He was pretty average looking by all accounts. The first few weeks, we had run into each other pretty often, and he would always make small talk, and he would always, and I mean always refer to me as Miss. I almost never ever saw his girlfriend after the first night, but I would occasionally hear him talking to a lady in his apartment as the walls were pretty thin. One night about three months after Sam moved in, my boyfriend is spending the night and we were watching some movies on the couch. It's maybe around 11.30 p.m. at this point. The back of my couch is right up against the wall that I share with Sam and we hear some banging noises. My first thought is that him and his girlfriend must be getting it on or something. My boyfriend and I laugh and we try and turn the volume up a bit just to drown them out. Then in addition to the banging, the neighbors begin screaming. We can hear objects being thrown, glass shattering, etc. The words are pretty muffled but there's distinctively anger and crying going on inside of there. My boyfriend, the great gym that he is, steps onto the semi-shared balcony and in his loudest voice then yells over, Hey, is everything okay in there? After about a minute or two later, the girl opens the sliding glass door on Sam's side and then she says, Sorry about that, so we leave it alone. I'm really concerned but we have no idea what actually happened and we decide to just go to bed. Big mistake. I wake up at around 3am to even more screaming, but my boyfriend refuses to wake up and I'm not about to take my 5 foot self to go and break up whatever's going on at 3am. I considered calling the police, but I was so drowsy that I just convinced myself that I was dreaming it. I deeply regret that decision. The next morning, I woke up to some really terrible personal news and pretty much put the events of that night on the back burner. I didn't forget, but it also wasn't on my mind anymore. Fast forward about two weeks. It's a really warm day and I'm outside reading a book, wearing a robe, sports bra, and shorts. I'm sitting in a chair that faces away from Sam's apartment, so I can't see a side from where I'm sitting. I'm deep into my book when I suddenly get tapped on the shoulder. Sam is standing behind me now, and he then asks if we can talk for a second. Now, this man has already crossed a line by coming on my side of the balcony, but I also can't get to my door without physically moving him aside, so I decide to ask him what's going on. He told me that it was his birthday, and he asked if I knew where he could get some weed, because, and I quote, I seemed like a girl who knows how to have a good time. As we live in a state where weed is pretty legal, I told him that I'm sure Google would provide the best dispensary in the area, but personally, I didn't have any on me. He proceeds to tell me how he got really drunk last night, and at this point, I'm absolutely itching for an exit. As I start to move as if to signal that I'm done talking to him, he reaches out for my shoulder, and that's when he tells me that he basically scratched my car last night because apparently he was driving while being wasted. He actually says all of this with a smile on his face, almost laughing about it. I'm surprised but mostly want to get away from him because my creep senses are totally going off now and I don't want to blow up at him for hitting my car. He says that he'll send me the info to his car insurance if I give him my number. And thankfully, I knew that that would be a bad call, so I didn't give him my number. I started to make a really bad nervous joke about knowing where he lived, and I said if the damage was bad enough, I'd just knock on his door to get his insurance. He then counters this by saying that he'll leave a note with his info on my door. He then retreats from my balcony while also saying that he'd prefer to just pay me in cash and not really involve insurance. I give it an hour or so and decide to head down to assess the damage. Sure enough, there's about two long really new scratches on the driver's side door. They're not that deep or really worthy of a call to insurance right away. I really just didn't want to get involved with them in any way, so I decided that I could just deal with the scratches. At this point, I just knew something was off about him. Nothing unusual happens as far as I was aware on this night. The next day is a Saturday, and as I had to work the next day, I'm home alone watching some action-y movie, and it's around 11 p.m. I'm on the sofa with my cat curled up on me and the movie is relatively loud, 
So it takes me a little while to register that there's this banging noise coming from the hallway of my apartment. I honestly only noticed because my cat had woken me up and had gotten all puffed up and freaked out about it. I turn down the volume of the film and suddenly the banging is now getting louder and louder now. And I just stand up and then I hear five words no one ever wants to hear coming from their door. Open up. It's the police. My stomach dropped to the floor. I had lied to Sam the day before. I totally did have weed. And I had smoked a joint right outside the balcony maybe about 20 minutes before. I'm totally panicked high as a kite and trying to control my breathing because I really don't want to come off suspicious before I answer the door. I remember checking the peephole to then see a close-up of a cop's face and then opening the door coming face to face with six officers, all of them with their guns drawn. I'm about five seconds away from completely pissing my pants in absolute fear, still convinced that I'm somehow in trouble for smoking a joint. The officer who seems to be in charge can pretty much sense immediately the level of my panic, and he then says, Ma'am, you're not in trouble. We really need to speak to you about your neighbor. Can we come in? At this point I'm reeling and my whole being is absolutely tense. I let the cops inside, but my heart hasn't moved from my throat. The policeman in charge asked me if I had any interactions with Sam. I tell them I barely know him and that he just lives by me and that he only moved in a few months ago. I ask why they needed to be in my apartment. I'm scared, but I also don't typically get along with cops, and I think I have the right to know why six of them practically just waved their guns in my face. The lead officer then proceeds to tell me that Sam is a really bad guy. He apparently beat his girlfriend so badly the night prior that she was now in the ICU for her injuries. They also told me that Sam had a gun and he had actually barricaded himself in the apartment next to mine. They said that they had spoken to the building manager and knew that my place had access to his balcony and they needed to use it. Then they asked me to go into my bedroom and lock the doors and also turn the lights off. The next 30 to 45 minutes were absolute hell. In my panic, I had left my cell phone on my kitchen counter and I had to sit in my room just listening to all of the commotion. No shots were ever fired, but there was a lot of yelling, and it also sounded like a lot of things were being thrown. Eventually, after what felt like a lifetime, the main officer knocked on my door and he told me that Sam had finally been arrested, and then he thanked me for letting him use my apartment. They had asked me more questions for maybe about 15 more minutes, and then left. I really wish this is where the story ended, but there is a bit more. In the days following Sam's arrest, I became even more panicked about him coming back to the apartment, really worried about retaliation. I hadn't really said anything to the police that would technically incriminate him, but I did tell them about the night that my boyfriend and I heard the fight. About five days later, Sam reappeared at the building as I was coming home from work one evening. He tried to approach me, but the elevator shut just as he was running to catch it. My entire body then got tense. Like the feeling you get when coming this close to getting in a car accident, but you narrowly avoid it. I then stayed off my balcony entirely from this point on, and I always kept the curtains closed. We didn't speak at all for another few weeks, and then we had our final interaction. Sam stopped me in the parking lot one night, literally running after me as I was about to get on the elevator. He begged me to tell him why I let the cops in that night. I told him the honest truth that I was absolutely stoned and didn't really know what to do and had a really bad history with cops. He then got pretty upset with me and kept trying to repeat the question, obviously wanting some kind of different answer. When I couldn't give him the answer he wanted, he then offered me about $3,000 to basically testify as a character witness on his behalf, because, and I quote, I apparently knew him and I also knew how he really treated women. I was speechless and absolutely freaked out. He told me that his hearing was the next Thursday morning and he asked if I could show up. I was like a deer in headlights for a moment and then somehow I got the hell out of there after mumbling a string of words that were most likely pretty incoherent. The Wednesday night that was before this trial, I came home from work and my cat was acting kind of weird, like something had just spooked her and her tail was puffed out. I kind of shook it off but I noticed through the curtains that there was something taped to the outside of my sliding glass door. Apparently Sam had decided to leave a post-it with his phone number and name on it, and underneath it said, I'm counting on you. Needless to say, I never showed up. 
I took a photo of the post-it, grabbed my cat, locked all of my doors, and stayed at my mom's house for about another five days after that happened. I did phone the police to let them know that he had been on my balcony again, but they never really followed up with anything. Eventually, my boyfriend came and we went back to my place together. Everything was as it should have been. I never saw Sam again, but a few weeks later, a lady I had never seen before was cleaning out his apartment. Maybe about a month after that, some new people moved in and things have been pretty normal ever since. I tried calling the police in the county jail to see if he was in lockup again, but no one was able to release information to me. I'm hoping that means he's there if he really did do what the police said he did. So Sam, I do want to say, I'm not really sure what happened, but my biggest regret is not calling the police when I felt like I should have. Hopefully I won't ever have to see your face for the rest of my life. The beginning of my junior year in college, I moved into a new house with a really awesome girl named Jess. One day after classes, my friend Meg and I were on the front porch smoking a blunt when this guy walked by. He then went up my driveway, which was shared by the house right next door where he lived. He said hi to me and he asked if I knew Jess. I said yeah and that she's my roommate and we made a little small talk for a second. I asked if he wanted a hit of the blunt and then he took one and then carried on. After Meg had left, I was still on the porch just finishing up some classwork when that neighbor came out of his house and then said hi to me again. He walked over to my porch and then came up the stairs. I didn't really think too much about it because, I mean, he was really chill earlier. He then went on to ask me relationship advice, but all kinds of really weird things. So there's this girl I'm talking to, but she's also sending nudes and hooking up with some other guy. Why won't she do that with me? I tried in the nicest way possible to then explain that maybe she's not into him. He then went on to ask me if I would hook up with someone right after meeting them, and also if I found him attractive. I definitely didn't want to hook up and I didn't find him attractive, but I also said that in the nicest way possible. He kept calling me beautiful and basically saying that I was one of the sexiest girls he'd ever met. The conversation got awkward, so I excused myself inside and told him that I'd see him later. Later that night, I had just gotten back from hanging out with a friend. She dropped me off and as she drove away and as I was opening my door, my neighbor then came swiftly out of his door almost like he was waiting for me. He ran over to my house and then posted himself right up against my house and then asked if I wanted to hang out. I declined, saying that I still had classwork that I really needed to finish before I went to bed. He was really eager. We can do the work together, then maybe we can cuddle. I declined yet again and again. He eventually gave up and then he started asking me more sexual questions, but about my own preferences, and then he asked me if I would hook up with him. I kept deflecting and I was really trying to leave. He eventually asked me for a hug, which I also declined, but on that one, he wouldn't give up. He ended up grabbing me and pulling me in tightly to his arms and then squeezing me, to which then left me feeling so sick to my stomach. I quickly pulled away as fast as I could, ran into my house, and then I locked the door. Some time goes by and I'm cooking in my kitchen when I then hear a knock at my front door. None of my friends were coming over so I wasn't expecting anyone, so I was pretty clueless as to who it was. I peeked around the corner and of course it's the neighbor. My stomach began to sink a little. However, instead of answering the door, I just snuck myself into the bathroom and then hid for a second hoping he'd think I'd fallen asleep. Another three knocks came, and then another, and then finally, absolute silence. Then all of a sudden, he begins calling out my name through the open window next to my door. Amy? Hello? Amy? I know you're home. I just have a few questions. Amy? Where are you? At this point, I was really sick to my stomach. I texted my friend Corey who lived in the fraternity house just right down the street from me to quickly run over here and act like he was here to hang out. Corey came and then he met the neighbor at my doorstep. I overheard the conversation which then consisted of, Are you her boyfriend? She told me she was doing homework tonight but now she's having friends over? I've been wondering if she likes me. Do you think she does? Can you tell me more about her? 
Corey did a really awesome job at deflecting, and I opened the door to get him inside the house as fast as I could. The neighbor had asked me to come outside just real quick. I did, and only because I felt safer with Corey right behind the door. He ended up asking me almost like the same questions from before, and then he ended the conversation with, Can I please have a hug? I told him I'd see him later, and then ran into the house. The next day, Jess returned from her boyfriend's, and I then told her all about our weird neighbor. Surprisingly, she apparently knew all about him and his ways. He had pretty much waited outside for her numerous times like he did for me, also watching her run up and down the street, and also trying to hang out and hug her as well. Jess eventually told her boyfriend all about my encounters with our neighbor, and he then went over to have a word with them. I'm not really sure what he said to him, but the neighbor never made eye contact with me again. I'm pretty sure that if I didn't speak up and tell Jess, things would have definitely gotten worse. I know lots of people have had far worse stories than I have, but this always sends chills right up my spine whenever I think about it. About four years ago when I was 15 years old, me and my parents had moved into a brand new apartment and we decided to get a puppy. We would walk him about four or five times a day, but we still struggled a lot with my dog separation anxiety. So I imagine for the first few weeks being there, it must have been hell for my neighbors because he would always bark and cry whenever we left him all alone. However, every time we talked to my neighbors, they would just tell us not to worry about it because they hardly ever heard him and everyone was fine with it. That is, except for Tony. One Saturday, I was home alone and someone knocked on my door. It was Tony. At first, he just seemed kind of somewhat surprised to see me open the door. But then he just smiled politely and then said, Hey, can you tell your parents to come see me when they get home, please? I said yes, and then he left. I thought nothing of it. When my parents came home, I told them about my encounter with Tony, and my dad went to his apartment, suspecting that it had something to do with my dog barking. Tony told my dad that my dog was a real barker and that he worked during the night and needed to get sleep during the day, so he would really appreciate it if we could find a way to make less noise, although he did say that he understood that he knows that it was hard to control a dog's bark. He also apologized for showing up at our door, saying that he didn't know I was alone in there. According to my dad, they had a pretty nice polite conversation. My father had apologized for the inconvenience and then came home and we did our absolute best to try and deal with my puppy's anxiety. And it worked. My dog of course did still bark but wasn't so agitated as he used to be. Flash forward a few weeks. Every time my dog would sense Tony going down the stairs of our apartment building, my dog would always go nuts. He was a fairly friendly dog towards people but for some reason he just absolutely hated this guy and Tony had stopped talking to us, pretty much ignoring us every time we ran into him, or he would simply just stare at us. One day, however, me and my mother came home and on our apartment door were six holes. It was like someone had punched the door with like a key or something sharp. My mother was pretty naive about it. She thought that maybe we had done the damage ourselves throughout the months that we'd been there. That's when Martha, one of our other neighbors, then called my mother really worried about me then questioning her if I had been home alone during that afternoon. My mom said no and that's when Martha tells us that someone had apparently been banging and kicking at our door while also screaming a ton of insults, making a scene that was so terrifying that her 11 year old son got so scared that he hid under his bed for like four hours until Martha came home because he thought someone was breaking into our house. A few weeks later, there was a city fair at night and my parents and I, plus Martha and her family, headed out to the building to go to the fair. We came back earlier around 11 p.m. It was almost 12 a.m. at this point, and someone had rang our doorbell. My dad went to see who it was, but no one responded. Usually when this happens, we either go to the window to try and see who it is, or we go downstairs, because it's usually the mailman. But since it was midnight, my dad found it very strange, and he didn't go downstairs. He pretty much just ignored it and we all went to bed. Well, the next morning, my mother runs into Martha and she tells my mom that when they got back from the fair, they found Tony hidden in the dark under the stairs with a freaking baseball bat in his hands. He looked really nervous but said someone had rang the doorbell and he found it really weird that someone would do that so late at night. 
so he apparently came downstairs to see who it was and with a baseball bat. My mom pretty much immediately knew exactly what happened. He had rang our doorbell expecting my dad to come downstairs and see who it was. I honestly don't really know if his plan was to attack my dad or not, but my father obviously worrying about me and my mother's safety since he wasn't home during the week, then went upstairs absolutely fuming and knocked on Tony's door. When Tony saw my father, I kid you not, he looked like he was about to pass out. My father had confronted him and Tony legit started crying. He told my dad that he sometimes did drugs and he really didn't know what he was doing. He then went on to apologize for actually damaging our door with a damn pocket knife and for what happened the night before as well. He didn't even lie about it. As it turns out, the reason my dog freaked out every time he sensed him and barked so much was well because Tony waited until everyone in the building had left for work and then he would go to my door and kick it, making my dog more furious every time and not so much because of his anxiety. My dad then said very calmly, this is the last time I'm going to talk to you. Next time you come near me or even look in the direction of my family again, I'm going to make my point very clear. Do you understand? The guy kept crying and trying to hug my dad. We went to the police and filed a report, but we finally stopped seeing Tony. Turns out his wife actually kicked him out and filed a restraining order for her and their daughter because apparently one morning she actually woke up with him staring at her and their daughter while they were sleeping and the entire house smelt like gas because apparently he left the stove on. We moved shortly afterwards and we never saw Tony again after that. Just some background. I grew up while not in a big city compared to many others, the biggest city in my state and it has a rather well-earned reputation for violence and crime. I happened to live just on the border of one of the toughest areas in the city. I lived in a trailer park that was in the trailer closest to the bar that was right next door. This bar had a pretty bad reputation and was repeatedly shut down after noise and violence disruptions, but it was always allowed to reopen as long as they changed the venue's name. I'm still very unclear on the logic of that rule. But anyways, I was no stranger to run-ins with due to unsavory types appearing seemingly out of nowhere and all of the different neighbors that I'd been warned to avoid. It was just the way it was around there, and from a young age, I just kind of assumed that that was just how life worked. People are dangerous, just stay away. The position of our trailer had a fence on one side that separated us and the bar and one other trailer, which for a really long time was owned by people who were never home, abandoned, or for a brief time. There was a single mom and her daughters who were both younger than me. During those years, it felt like a cushion against anything threatening. After the single mom and her kids were evicted though, that's when the creepy neighbor dude then moved in and my life changed. It was my freshman year of high school, so I was about 13 to 14 years old at the time. My home life was not exactly leave it to beaver material to say the least, but due to a mix of never really knowing anything different and being naive, I was only just beginning to realize that it wasn't the norm for other people. I was really sad to lose those girls as neighbors because even though they were younger, they were my only friends in the park. After some probably highly illegal evictions that my crazy old landlady had done a few years previous, then this man moved in. Now he was the only one who technically lived there, but during the first year or so, I would often see him in his yard with a group of men. They were old enough for my adolescent brain to deem them old, but younger than my parents. So it was probably a mix of late 20s to mid 30s. At times, their drunken behavior was pretty comparable to the people at the bar from the other side. Things were pretty awkward from the day he moved in. Unfortunately, the first awkwardness was due to my stepfather just being a terrible human being. He was racist and proud and really amused by his racist views. The new neighbor was black. So within about two weeks, there was a six foot fence that was built between the length of our trailers because he didn't want the new neighbor on the one foot wide strip of our property that had literally never mattered before. And of course, he took a really great joy in saying insulting horrible things as he and I built it. However, our new neighbor never made any kind of complaint about his words or the absurd fence. He was really polite and he would always wave at us whenever we would get home. 
This made me feel incredibly guilted, embarrassed, and pretty much indebted to this stranger for not only responding to my stepfather's hate and kind, but also repaying us with kindness. Unfortunately, that very reaction helped set up a really dangerous situation. One thing that had started even before the fence was actually finished was that he and his group of friends would always move closer to the front of his trailer if they ever saw me leave to check the mail by myself. Our mailbox was a community box in the middle of the park, and me checking it was one of my chores. I would leave to the mailbox and they'd either be inside on the porch or in the yard. Inevitably, I would always come back to them then congregating in the front or driveway area. He would say hello to me and his friends would just stare and then laugh. I've always been pretty afraid of strangers and, well, religious people in general. It was a long-running joke in my family just how frightened and uncomfortable that I would get around strangers. They all knew I would grow out of it, and they thought that I would think it was funny too. Well, I haven't, and I don't. And my gut has actually saved me and protected me more times than I can count, so I'm no longer ashamed of my wariness. I would mumble hello, try to smile, and then wave at them, but I'm pretty sure I looked spooked because that was pretty much my natural state. I was sure that they were laughing because I probably looked scared, but as time passed, I began to feel more comfortable saying hello and waving at them. They'd all still laugh though, which once again would make me uncomfortable all over again. I just couldn't figure out what they were laughing at. Was it at me, my voice, my smile, the way I was waving? Did I walk funny? More than anything, I really just wished that they'd ignore me at that point. Then one day as I walked down to the mailbox, the neighbor ran up to me and then walked with me, and that became the daily norm. He would come join me and ask me normal questions about my day, school, etc. as we walked. I really didn't like it. It was more than my normal anxiety. I pretty much just always heard alarms going off every time he was near me. But I didn't really trust myself back then. I'd been told so many times how stupid I was for being afraid that I just kept berating myself for being paranoid about this nice man who had never actually done anything wrong. Also of note, he never once checked his own mail during these trips. If he had, it would have at least given me a fraction of comfort. If he just needed to check his mail too, then it wasn't weird that he came to the mailbox with me. One particular afternoon, the dialogue, well, started to change on these trips. We were at the mailboxes once again, and then he said, Hey, so don't tell your dad I said this, but you've got really great legs. While looking me up and down, I don't really know why at the time, but I really just wanted to cry and take a shower. I just knew he shouldn't have said that. I had stopped checking the mail for maybe about three weeks after that. It took a long time for my parents to notice that I probably wasn't being truthful when I told them. There wasn't anything in the mailbox today. My mom had started yelling at me for being too lazy to walk to the mailbox, and I finally just told her that I wasn't being lazy. I was scared of the neighbor. I then explained that he'd been going to the mailbox with me and what he said. And well, dear old mom thought it was absolutely hilarious. She pretty much just thought that I was being stupid and shy and pretty much scared over nothing. She brought it up in dinner and then insisted I tell my stepfather. I halfway thought that just maybe he'd get it. After all, the neighbor said not to tell him so he must have known it wasn't okay. My stepdad went quiet for a moment and then he said, well, you do have nice legs, so what? So I was ashamed because it was obviously nothing and I just needed to get a grip. I eventually started checking the mail again and the neighbor didn't join me anymore, which made me feel guilty because I was afraid I hurt his feelings. But he was also no longer hanging out with the group of friends all the time. For a while, he was rarely even home, but when he was home, he was always alone. Fast forward a few months or so, I started randomly seeing him whenever I was home alone or checking the mail. He'd always wave and smile at me, then enforcing that feeling of shame for overreacting. But then on one evening while I was taking a shower, my mother banged on the door, then yelling that I was steaming up the bathroom and that it was going to make the carpet mold. So as I'd done many times before, I turned the crank to open the little window in the shower to let some steam out. 
This window was pretty much exactly forehead level at top, but only about four to five inches tall and ran the length of the shower wall. I'd been opening it while showering pretty much every day since I was five or six. You couldn't see the person in the shower except for their head, and even then you'd have to be looking to even notice it. I cracked it open, but I then heard a sound, so I then looked out. I immediately made eye contact with creepy neighbor dude. I instantly looked away because I felt like I was being rude by looking out the window. I then kind of crouched to try and hide my head and try to continue with my shower, but I felt exposed and really uncomfortable. So a couple of minutes later, I decided to peek out the window again just to reassure myself that it was really just an unfortunate coincidence. He was still there leaning on his porch railing when he then smiled slowly when we made eye contact again. I closed the window and then quickly finished. I lectured myself endlessly that it was all just a coincidence and that I was just being stupid again. But after it happened about three different times, I just started taking really fast cold showers so that I didn't have to open the window. Shortly after the unpleasant shower event started, he started waiting outside for me whenever I'd get home from school. I would walk home from the bus stop and he just happened to be in front of his trailer. At first it was just every now and then, but then it became daily. He would walk out into my path and then block me from my front gate. He would make small talk like he'd done countless times during the walks to the mailbox. I would always answer as politely as I could while also insisting that I really needed to get inside and take care of my dogs since they'd been inside all day while my parents were at work and I at school. Around that time, there was a girl about a year younger than me that moved into the park at the far other end. She was really nice and we had a class together, but we didn't really talk to each other. That is until one day when we got off the bus and she told me to hold on. She asked if I wanted her to walk with me. I was really surprised and confused by the offer, but really excited that maybe he'd leave me alone if I wasn't alone. I accepted her offer and then she asked me if I knew the creepy guy that lived next door to me. I was so relieved that someone else thought he was creepy that I actually wanted to cry and laugh at the same time. She said that about a week before, she'd stopped at the landlord's trailer to ask a question. And when she left, she saw me walking to my door and him just standing there watching. And then when he saw her, he started walking with her and trying to talk to her as well. And then he told her she had beautiful hair. She told him to screw off and then she ran the rest of the way home. She and I developed a system where she would walk me to my driveway and then I'd stand on my porch and walk her until she turned on the corner where I and he could no longer see her. He finally stopped waiting for us after school. A couple of weeks went by with nothing really weird happening. It was now fall and when I left for the bus stop in the mornings, it was dark now and my new friend only rode the bus in the afternoon. One morning he saw me leave for the bus and then he called for me to have a good day. From that point on, he was always there when I would leave the house. Both of my parents worked really early shifts, so I was usually always alone from about 5.30 a.m. and it was obvious because their vehicles were gone. At first, he would pretend to have something to do outside at the exact same time and always act surprised to see me. Then he started just sitting out in front of his house waiting. Halloween came and I wore a costume to school. I was 15 years old and like most costumes that you can buy at Party City or Walmart in a bag, it was admittedly a bit revealing. Nothing crazy. I was like Midnight Spider Witch or some other nonsense. It was a long sleeve dress that went down to my ankles, but was much more form-fitting than anything I normally wore. It was a little low cut and had a slit up the side that went higher than one might want. I waited and watched out that tiny shower window and didn't leave at normal time. I saw him go inside his house and then I made a break for it. He eventually caught up to me before I was even completely past his driveway. He made some really creepy comments about how I sure was growing up nice and then warning me to be careful with boys. I ran for the bus stop calling over my shoulder that I had to hurry or I'd miss the bus. After that, he then started waiting for me in my driveway at my gate in the mornings. I would completely get ready for school then peek out my window to see if he was there and he almost always was. He would pace back and forth and whistle. Some mornings I would go out and just face him, but then he started touching my shoulder or putting his hand on my back, so I literally started ditching school just to avoid him. I would call my mom at work and say that I missed the bus or that the bus came early. 
One of my friends was learning how to drive and every once in a while he would pick me up to make sure I went to school. My neighbor would retreat to his own driveway and then he would glare at us as I got in the car and we drove off. One day after I had missed almost a full week of school, he was in his driveway with about three other guys waiting for me when I came from checking the mail. He called my name as I went to walk past him. I gave him a wave but continued my walking. He then intercepted me and then he said, Wait, I have a gift for you since you've been homesick. I made it for you. He then proceeded to hand me some kind of door hanger thing. It was made of beads and it had my name on it and the colors were the exact color scheme of my bedroom. I was beyond freaked out at this point. First of all, until that day, he never even once said my name, and I had felt some really odd comfort in believing that he didn't know it. Second of all, he had never been inside my home, not even for a second that I was aware of, and I just knew that my racist stepfather wouldn't have allowed him in, and my mother was way too afraid of my stepfather to allow him in. My bedroom was at the front of the trailer and had two big windows, but my scaredy cat self was way too cautious of who or what may peek inside to ever open my blinds or curtains even for a minute. The color scheme of my room wasn't exactly an easily guessed combination. I then said something that resembled a thank you and made my way inside while he and his friends watched me go and then laughed. I took it with me to school the next day and I broke down crying to all of my friends. They all thought it was pretty weird of course, but since he never actually hurt me, some of them thought that I was just being too paranoid and that he was just a nice but strange guy. Some of them actually agreed with me that it was really wrong and it felt like it was building up to something bad. My friend that I mentioned earlier who would sometimes give me rides was really worried because of how angry the guy acted whenever I got rides. In fact, that same friend picked me up and brought me home from school for the rest of the year. I tried to do my best to just never be outside my home alone from that point on. A couple of months later, I got a job and I decided to drop out and get my GED and pretty much just started not being home period as much as possible. We had a few uncomfortable run-ins where he'd say weird things like, You've got a good figure, just what men want. Be careful not to lose that figure. But once I got help from friends, it became pretty easy to avoid him. So, plot twist. About three years later after the gift incident, life had changed for me in a gazillion ways. Not the least of which the FBI actually arrested my stepfather and he went to federal prison. So, my mother had found herself living in the trailer all alone, as I had moved out before that. While on the phone one night, she then asked, What do you think of Bobby? To which I then responded that I didn't know a Bobby. Getting kind of annoyed, she then said, He's lived next door for years. Don't you remember? Your dad hated him. I pretty much laughed and then said, Oh, you mean creepy neighbor guy? Obviously, I think he's creepy. Cue awkward silence and then her saying, Oh, well he kissed me today. I think I like him. Cue shocked and dismayed silence followed by me reminding her about the leg comment and all the other times that he was creepy to me. Her response? Oh, you know how you are. You're just always scared of everyone. You probably just had a crush on him and didn't realize it. Spoiler alert, it didn't work out for them romantically. But he did try to become a squatter in her trailer, and he actually had to be forcibly removed from it. So yeah, creepy neighbor Bobby. I'm so damn glad that I finally moved out of there, and I never have to see you ever again. Thank God. Something pretty scary happened to me at the LAX airport, and I didn't realize the gravity of it until this morning. Following my gut instinct saved our lives. My husband and I were in California seeing my grandma and grandpa at the time. We were waiting for a Lyft driver to come and pick us up and take us to my grandpa's house when a man with a Lyft sticker pulled up to where we were and told us that he was ready for new riders and that he could take us now and when we were in the car to just add that we were on his route. I started to consider it as he was just right there and he was pretty nice. He even took the phone right out of my hands to try and cancel the lift that we had already ordered. But it seemed really weird to me, and my gut instinct was absolutely screaming not to go. He then got upset and said that we wasted his time. Big eye roll, and then he got in his car and drove away. As he did, 
I decided to take a photo of his license plate. I immediately sent an email to Lyft. They did an investigation and this morning I got an email that said that that license plate has never been used in their system and that they're really happy I didn't end up going with the man. There's been similar things in Los Angeles just like this that have gotten people killed. And like I said at the beginning of the story, my gut instinct probably saved our lives. I mentioned in a previous post that for a good week, my car was in the shop getting fixed. This resulted in me lifting just about everywhere and having to deal with a lot of weirdos. Now, I already thought that the last lift driver I had was already pretty bad, but this guy takes the creepy cake. I had just finished my shift and this dude picks me up by the name of Angel. But anyways, as I get into the back seat of his car, he pulls up my lift photo and then zooms in on it repeatedly before he stares at me in the rear view mirror. This is you? He asks. Um, yeah. No, no way. How old are you? You look so cute. How old are you? As he says this, he keeps pulling up my lift photo. I'm 22. What? How old were you when you took this photo? You look like a child. You're so cute. Wow. In my head, I was just like, two years ago, get off my butt. But instead, I didn't really answer and just kind of brushed him off. He continues driving all the while staring at me whenever he can. We get to a red light and he changes the radio station from Katy Perry to the Spanish channels. I instantly groan inside because I'm mixed race and this is getting pretty old for me. A lot of people do this thing to me where they try and see if I can speak their language or know enough about their culture, as if to approve me or something. You speak Spanish? You know this song? This is real Spanish music. You should give it a listen. No, I don't speak Spanish, thanks. Do you know any Spanish artists? No, I don't. Well, that's okay. Even if you don't speak Spanish, you'll do good on your honeymoon. I ask what he means by that, and he doesn't really give me an answer. Instead, he asks what my work schedule's like, how many days a week I work, is it always at that location, do I live alone, etc. I answer him instead in half-truths, saying, oh, I don't have a schedule yet or a fixed location as I'm training between locations. That way he can't really find me or know my routine at all. He just nods and hums, all the while still just glancing at me right in the mirror. A car cuts him off and then he honks before stating loudly, Move! Move! I have a really pretty girl in the back seat of my car. I tell him to let me out of the corner and he says no, that'll take me to my door. Because I don't want it to be too obvious that I'm freaked out, I tell him to go up to these random townhouses which are all connected by a path and park. He lets me out at the front of some random house and I move behind it and then wait until he drives off before I zigzag around all of these pathways. I mean hell. I almost got lost myself by walking around all these weird pathways until I finally found myself home. I almost got lost by walking around all these weird pathways until I finally found myself home. So yeah, Angel, let's definitely not encounter each other again. Okay, so this happened about a year ago. I'm in a long distance relationship and I often fly to visit. I didn't have a ride arranged to come and pick me up, so I usually just use a Lyft or Uber to get to and from the airport. This particular ride started off fine. It was a guy from Haiti and he had a very thick accent that was often hard to understand. The beginning of the ride was just him making small talk like most drivers do. Where are you flying from? Are you in college? Do you have family here? And so on. We get on the freeway and there's a lot of traffic. I had a layover flight and of course all of the outlets were in use so I couldn't charge my phone. I'm really hoping that this traffic lightens up soon because I really need to keep in contact with the people I'm going to be staying with. Of course, with my luck, the app crashes and then says, You have arrived. While we're literally in the middle of the freeway near no houses at all. I get kind of annoyed and the driver says that he'll pull over at this Walmart that's nearby so we can try and figure out what's wrong. Apparently he had a very old phone and it wasn't giving proper directions, so I said that we could use mine but that I needed to charge it. He asked me to sit up front so that it was easier and I thought nothing of it so I decided to go up front. 
He tells me that he'll take me the rest of the way for free without using the Lyft app. I put the address in my phone and we're back on our way. As we're pulling out of the Walmart parking lot, he then decides to ask me how old I am. I told him that I'd just turned 18, and that's when things got kinda weird. He seemed to lighten up at how young I was, which was a bit odd, but whatever. He then asked me a series of questions like, Why don't you live here? You should move here. You should go to college here, so why don't you? I'm a doctor and Lyft is just a side job for me, so I have a lot of money. This man was at least in his mid-40s. I told him that I had no money to just randomly move states and start college, seeing as I had just become a legal adult. He then told me, I can take care of you. I'll buy you a little apartment and a nice car, and I can take you out and pay for your college. I thought that he was joking, so I kind of just awkwardly laughed and then said, That's okay, you don't need to do that. But he just kept insisting on it, and I was starting to get really creeped out. I really didn't want to jump to conclusions. I thought that maybe he's just not sure how to hold proper conversations since he's foreign or something. About 20 minutes later, we're about 5 minutes away from my destination. My phone kept doing that annoying thing where it's charging then not charging that phones do whenever the charger wires are loose. I had this phone for a really long time so it did this sometimes, and apparently it hadn't really been charging much at all, and then it died. Since we were so close to the destination though, I told him that I knew the rest of the way. But I'd tell him to turn right and he'd say okay and then purposely turn left or keep going straight. Literally anything but what I told him to do. Now we're lost because he's literally ignoring everything I'm saying and playing it off as some sort of an accident and I'm not super familiar with the entire area. I really only knew a small portion of the streets. He tells me that he lives nearby and I start getting really scared because I think he's going to kidnap me or something. I then let out a single tear. I tell myself to keep it together because usually in the movies, whenever they see fear, they usually get mad or something. So I try really hard to try and make it seem like I'm not totally losing my crap. He finally turns back around and when we're almost there again, he then starts purposely going the wrong way yet again. At this point, I got my phone to about 5%. He reaches over while at a red light, grabs my phone, and then he rates himself 5 stars on Lyft and also friends me on Facebook. He also puts his phone number in my phone and tells me to call him if I ever need anything and that we should go out sometime. I give a little fake smile so he doesn't know that I'm about to crap myself from all of the fear. I eventually get so fed up that I just jump out at another red light and then tell him, Thanks, but you're really scaring me. Bye. I then call my boyfriend on my 5% battery life and I tell him where I am because I'm really scared and I need him to pick me up. The Lyft driver is now shouting out the window for me to get back in the car, but there's no way in hell I was going back in there to be some man's sugar baby, and was also a total stranger. I then decide to go somewhere with a lot of people and wait for my boyfriend. Now, this whole ordeal actually made the ride last about two and a half hours, and it should have only taken about 45 minutes, even with all of the traffic. Later, I called Lyft, and I told them everything. He was supposedly fired, so I guess that's good. Anyway, to the random Lyft driver looking for a young sugar baby to try and kidnap, if you happen to see me again whenever I visit, please just stay away from me. To give a bit of background, I'm a female and I drive for Lyft at night. I'm on the shorter side at about 5 foot 4 tall and I've been driving for nearly 6 months. I tend to drive downtown Denver, especially on weekends when there's a lot of money to make. In this time, I've only had a couple of truly scary encounters. I drive about seven nights a week and at least a couple of hours at night. The first scary story started out pretty normal enough for pretty late at night. I had just dropped off a passenger in Aurora and I was marking my way back towards Market Street since the bars hadn't closed yet. I get a pickup that's on the way. It's a nice enough area that I don't really feel uncomfortable, but anyone who knows Aurora, Colorado knows that it's not really the best area, even with a few nice areas. A couple of guys hop in the car. One in front and one in the back and both have hoodies on and are carrying backpacks. But this is Colorado and it's almost 1.30 in the morning so it's not that odd. 
Where it gets odd is after they get in. I give my normal greeting, but they completely ignore me. They shove their backpacks onto the floor, and then they pull their hoods up while shielding their faces from the windows with their hands. I was instantly uncomfortable, and I could feel that something was off. It was only about a 10 minute drive, and we were in a secluded area, so I decided the safest thing I could do was just complete the ride. I could then feel my fight or flight instinct totally kicking in. Within about a minute, I had then decided that if they were going to try anything, I was going to crash my car. Neither one had put on a seatbelt, so I figured that would probably be my best chance. Once we arrived at the location that they wanted to be dropped off at, I could just tell it wasn't a good area. Bars on the windows, trash all over the place, and there were a lot of cars in disrepair. They get out of the car but don't shut my doors, then start whispering to each other, all the while glancing at me. One of them has his hand in his pocket and he's fidgeting with something. At this point, I've totally had enough and step on the gas, driving off with all of the doors open. I drive for a couple of miles until I get to a gas station with lights and people, before I stopped to properly close the doors. I called it a night and I headed home to cuddle my toddler and my husband before having a good cry in the safety of my own bed. I have absolutely no idea what they were planning, but I do know that I was absolutely terrified from the moment they pulled their hoods up to the moment I drove off with my doors open. The second story takes place a couple of weeks after the first. I had sworn off all pickups in Aurora and the shady parts along with Colfax at night. I would still drop people off there but I would also turn my app off and then leave the area whenever I was done. I was downtown as usual for a Saturday night and the bars were closing. I get a shared ride which can be very good at bar closing. Now the thing about shared rides is you can't request more than two seats, leaving room for two more people. I have on multiple occasions had a full car with these types of rides. I get to the person, then unlock my doors as normal, and then gets in about three people. Okay, small problem. I'm polite, and I tell them that I can't give them a ride with three people, so they're going to have to order a different lift. This is where this one turns. I don't want to have to pay more money. I'm really sorry, but either one of you has to get out, or all of you do, and you need to order a different ride. This is a shared ride, and that means I could get two more passengers and they need seats. With shared rides, you're only allowed to book two seats for two passengers. Well, I'm not going to pay more money, so you can just ignore the other rides and take us home. At this point, he became really aggressive, and he then started putting his finger right in my face. Maybe I should have been more scared, only this is Market Street at bar close, and it's really packed. There are drunk people just about everywhere, and where there are drunk people, there's also cops. I roll down my window as he continues to tell me what I'm going to do, and then starts threatening me. He says that he's going to put me in my place if I don't start driving right now. I made eye contact with a cop, and was focusing on getting his attention. Okay, you have a new choice. You can get out, or I can get the cop right there to get you out. Said cop was then making his way over, now seeing that something was wrong. They all jumped out of the car, guy was flipping me off, and then they disappeared into the crowd while still looking for rides. The cop stopped to ask if I was okay, and I gave him a short rundown of everything that happened, and then I thanked him for coming over. I then headed off to my next ride, who was a very polite gentleman. In both cases, I reported them to Lyft so that I wouldn't get paired with them ever again. I always carry pepper spray now for defense. I also have a dash cam that records the interior of my car now. Since the last one, I haven't really had any kind of issues. And hopefully it stays that way. This past summer for my graduation gift, my mom and grandma took me to Alberta to go watch the Spruce Meadows Masters Tournament. If you don't know what that is, it's basically one of the world's largest horse shows. We flew out there, so we decided to use Uber to get to and from the showgrounds. We don't have Uber where I'm from, but everyone always said that the Uber drivers in the area were really awesome. 
for the first three days, the drivers were great. They picked us up within about five minutes or so, and they usually got us there in about 15 minutes tops, and the cars were always really clean and safe. On day four, we called for an Uber that was about 45 minutes before the time we wanted to be picked up at, which was 9.30 a.m. 10 a.m. rolled around, and we thought we'd give it another 10 minutes before calling for a different driver. 10.05ish, and the original driver finally shows up. Now, in his profile, it said that he was driving a 2017 Dodge Journey, but when he got there, it was definitely the right guy, but he was in this old, rundown looking beater. My first instinct was to go up to the driver's window and ask him to roll it down. Before I could ask him his name, just to make sure and also ask him what happened to the car that the app said he would be driving, he almost shouted at me in a very angry tone. Yes, I'm so-and-so. This is my sister's car. Mine's in the shop. Now ladies, hurry up and get in. I have other rides waiting for me. I was shocked and already scared at this point. I looked at my mom and grandma and they said to just get in, so I did. I sat in the back with my grandma and my mom sat in the front. We told him where we needed to go and we were on our way. He had taken a different route that he claimed was quicker. On the highway in Calgary, 15 minutes is already pretty fast. 15 to 20 minutes had passed and he had began chatting at my mom in a very flirtatious way the whole ride. He had taken us to the countryside that seemed to be forever away from where we were going. It was actually pretty much the opposite direction, and I asked him if he knew where he was going and if he could get us back onto the highway. He ignored me and just kept driving. About another 10 minutes had passed and I was freaking the heck out. My mom was obviously quite uncomfortable as well and we were still in the countryside. He then pulls over on the side of the road and we just sat there for about a solid 5 or 6 minutes. At this point I was really shaking and I had to hold my grandma's hand because I was so scared. The driver turned around and then he put his hand on my leg but I quickly shifted away, then he proceeded to look at all three of us and then say, I'm sorry for the long ride, ladies. I know I've gone out of the way, but you're all just too beautiful for me to let you leave so soon. Dude, what the heck? I wanted to get out of the car so bad. We all just sat there in silence and all I could really think was, Holy crap, this guy's gonna kill us. He had made some more creepy remarks towards me commenting on how youthful and full of life I am. Really creepy stuff. After sitting there in shock for what felt like hours, my sweet quiet grandma then screamed at him, telling him to turn around and get back on the highway. He finally pulled off the side of the road and then continued on the country road. The whole way there he kept looking back at me and making a lot of sexual remarks. About an hour and a half later we finally got to the grounds. I was extremely shaken up by all of this and I was almost in tears. I really wish that we would have just called another Uber. I really hope he doesn't do this to all of his female passengers. It's absolutely disgusting. I'll never be taking a ride share ever again. So to that creepy and awful Uber driver who not only made remarks about me but also my mom. You literally made me miss like two hours of the show, and you also scared me half to death. And also, I gave you zero stars on the app. Let's never ever meet ever again, and I really hope that Uber fires you in the near future. You really deserve it. It was May 19th of this year, and it was my birthday. Me and my mom were just leaving a music gig from a coffee shop and my mom decided that she'd rather us take a lift than take the bus because the buses around here are pretty dangerous at nighttime, especially with all of the drunk people, as well as people with guns and people who start fights. We've never had a bad or weird lift or Uber experience before this one. Neither of us were expecting this to happen, especially in the part of the city that we were in because it's not the bad part of the city or anything. The lift came. It didn't come up to the coffee shop though. It kind of parked in the dark street where it was really hard to see. I'm not really sure why he did that but whatever. We got in the lift. Everything seemed fine. 
We thought we were on our way home, but as it turns out, we could have potentially gotten kidnapped. We both start to notice that he was taking a weird route at first. One that turned him not to even going in the direction of our town. We asked him, Hey man, where are you going? And said, You're supposed to go on this highway over here. He wouldn't respond. He kept his eyes on the road the entire time. My mom even tried to tap him on the shoulder, and still, nothing. The only thing that he said to us during the whole ride there was, You're going to end over, right? We both simultaneously screamed no at him, and then he laughed, but it wasn't just a chuckle, it was a malicious laugh. He was indeed going to Andover, and that was definitely not the city that we put in for the address. Andover is about 30 miles away from where we live. As he was getting further from our town, we then started to panic even more than we already were. My mom called the police begging them to send a cop car or to do something to stop this man. They actually said to my mom, Ma'am, there's not really anything we can do about it. You're kidding me, right? We were being taken somewhere by a freaking stranger and who knows what his intentions were. The operator must have not been taking my mom seriously because it didn't make any sense. The operator just kept saying that they couldn't really do anything about what was happening and they told us to just stay on the line until we were safe. What if we were never safe in the end though? It honestly sounded like they weren't going to do anything unless this man harmed us or said something violent. They just didn't care whatsoever. As we were almost in Andover, the lift driver changed his mind and he apparently turned the car around and headed for our town, but he still wasn't speaking to us. Me and my mom are still scared the entire time, even after we arrived at our house. I'm pretty sure I saw a gun that was sticking out of his pocket. Both me and my mom now are very wary about Lyft, Uber, etc. And we always take extra precaution now whenever we use those services. I recommend to anybody else to do the same. Be careful out there. This happened a couple of months ago. December of last year. I had started working a new job in the mall and had to work for most of Boxing Day. I was done at about 10 p.m. and transit seemed to have ended at 7 p.m. I decided to call an Uber and the driver picked me up right in front of the mall. We had a casual conversation during the drive back and he learned about where I worked and how I'm living on my own for the time being since all of my roommates went to their hometowns. Fast forward to the next day at work, around 6 p.m. This driver walks into the store and tries to strike a conversation with me, but I told him I had to get back to work. He also asked if we could hang out later, to which I told him no and then he left. At the end of that shift, around 10 p.m., I walked out of the store planning to take transit. As soon as I stepped out of the store, the driver immediately pulled up next to me and offered to give me a free ride back home. After going back and forth with me declining it and him saying it's free, I decided to walk away and caught a bus home. I was pretty overwhelmed by the fact that he showed up to my workplace and waited three hours until I was done with work to offer me a ride home. I reported this to Uber and they notified me that they suspended the driver, provided me with a full refund, and also gave me a link to provide to the police if I plan on filing a report on this. It was really silly of me to give away information like that to a stranger, but hopefully I don't see that driver ever again. I definitely learned a lesson from this. This happened to me a few years ago. It was New Year's Eve and I had just been out in the city to celebrate with three of my closest friends. At the end of the evening when we were all really exhausted and ready for bed, one of our friends traveled to her house near the club while the others made the hour-long trek back to our home suburb. There were three of us together, all females. The trip to our suburb typically involved a 45-minute long bus trip, then an Uber or taxi to our houses. I've lived in that area my entire life and I'm very familiar with the most convenient way to get to and from my house. On this particular evening, we got off the bus and then I booked an Uber with my phone. It was around 4 a.m., so as you can imagine, our remote little town had very little road traffic at this time. 
A car pulls up at the bus stop and this was the first car that we'd seen since arriving. And there was no one else around except for us, so we assumed it was our ride, then got in. Our Uber driver was a Russian man with a very thick accent, although he didn't really speak a lot. Immediately I noticed that he was taking us in the wrong direction of my house, but I figured it's fine. Sometimes the GPS just takes drivers on different routes, so I just brushed off the thought. Then about 10 minutes later, I get a text that my Uber driver's arriving at my pickup destination. Really angry that I was way too tired or intoxicated to remember the message that you usually receive before your ride pulls up, but also terrified that I may have gotten my two best friends and myself into a vehicle with a man that we didn't know at all. My actual Uber driver then tried to call me, presumably to find out where we were, but I ignored the call, not wanting to alert the man who had actually picked us up. At that point, I still hadn't said anything about any of this to my best friends, but I asked the driver if he'll stop at a service station so that I could grab a drink of water before we continued the journey, because I made the excuse that I felt sick. He then questioned me. We aren't that far from your destination now, but I insisted, so he agreed. When we arrived at the service station, I desperately asked all of my friends to get out of the car with me, and they obliged. I explained the situation to them, and we all agreed to tell the driver that we were going to walk to a friend's house that was nearby, and to not worry about the rest of the trip. He seemed frustrated, and he absolutely insisted to take us, but we refused to get back in the car. We ended up just getting a cab to get us back home from there. So, to the Uber driver who may have not actually even been an Uber driver, definitely don't pick us up again. It's really great to see that Uber now warns users to always check the license plate before getting into a car, but my story happened about a year before that was put in place. A couple of friends and I were spending New Year's Eve at a house party. The new year hit, the party was winding down, and my friend ordered an Uber. Mind you, all four of my companions were some combination of pissed drunk or baked out of their minds. I was decently buzzed, but by far the most sober of the group. I assumed the role of mom friend and got the rest of the group to the street to wait for the car. It was absolutely freezing, pitch black, and the street was completely empty. A car pulled up and my friend announced that it was our Uber, so everyone had started to make their way over to it. Out of nowhere, I get this really sick feeling in my gut. My lizard brain then kicks into overdrive and tells me to get the hell away from that car. That's when I realized that the car was missing an Uber sticker. Since my friend was way too drunk to care, I grabbed her phone to check the license plate. This wasn't our Uber. I realized at the same moment that my friend had walked over to the driver's side window to ask if this was the Uber for Sarah, and he then told her that he was. I yelled to her that this was the wrong car, but she was too gone to care. But he says he's our driver. She slurred. I channeled my inner mom and then yelled to her that this was not our driver and that the car had the wrong license plate. Instead of walking away from the car, she asked him why the license plate was different if he was actually here for Sarah. And I kid you not, this idiot actually tells her that he put the wrong license plate on the car this morning, and she was so drunk that she actually believed him and almost opened the door to get inside. I yell at her to get the heck away from the car right now because that is not our driver. Finally, she starts to walk away, but the driver grabs her arm and tries to force her in. The friend next to Sarah then pulls her away, but the guy looked visibly unhinged at this point and actually ordered her to get in the car. The first thing I could think to do was to take my phone out, start filming the car, and then yell, Hey dickhead, I'm filming you. This got his attention real good and he was down the street before I could even say another word. About a second goes by and the real Uber finally shows up. We were all spooked, but they were drunk, tired, and ready to let it go just to keep the good vibe going. All I could think of was some poor drunk girl leaving a party alone and forgetting to check the license plate. So as the only one who wanted to do something and also the only one under 21, I decided to call the cops. Not great in hindsight, but I'd rather get busted for being just shy of 21 and kind of buzzed than let someone get possibly kidnapped and whatever else. It all turned out just fine, and they actually caught the guy before he could ever find another victim. But we never found out what his motive was or what happened after that.
The best part of the entire ordeal, though, was the one guy in our group and his reaction. I've known him since kindergarten, and he's one of the smartest people I know, but he was so drunk that he actually believed the guy was just a nice dude trying to help us out. He tried to convince me not to call the cops because it would only ruin the guy's night, and because it was New Year's, the guy should have fun. He still absolutely denies this ever happened. In conclusion, always check your Uber's license plate. And I really mean always.